Yeah, can you hear us? Nancy, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, That's I'm, okay. Don't worry I'm about it. Sure, no problem. All right, I'm just going to call the meeting to order. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. <laughs> um, okay, so our first um, item is um, the Audubon Society. We have the director, uh, help me, Amy, Amy Barno. Barno. Okay, it's just like it sounds. <laughs> Development uh, director, Joyce Leach, uh, Tr Tricia Lombardi, and assistant director of the Fairfield region. And we have this on the agenda. Uh, this is the only nonprofit we scheduled because this is a bit of a unique situation. The Audubon came to us to request funding for uh, a rehabilitation project that they're undertaking that's going to be far more than what we're putting in the budget, but it is, um, in my opinion, a, a, a contribution on the town side to show that we are invested in this uh, facility that are, all of our school children utilize. Um, I'm sure both Nancy and Tom's children did. I know mine did, and that was a long time ago. Uh, and so this is obviously, I think, a, a valuable asset to our community and to our students, as well as our broader community. So I'm going to invite you to, um, how are we working this? Are we doing it this way? OK. All right, so come on up. Good, thank you. Hey, you um, what page are we on? What page are we on, Jared? Do we know? This is just going to be it's, it's gonna be a, one of the single lines. Yeah, yeah page ninety nine. Page ninety nine, Tom. Thank you. There it is. Okay. All right. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So, if you just want to give a brief overview of the project and you know what you're intending to do, that would be really helpful. Sure. So, just to be very clear, um, our full request to the town of Fairfield was for seventy five thousand dollars. 30,000 of that is for the annual um, funding support that you provide that allows us to bring to support the cane program. And and uh, so we appreciate the feisty, <laughs> the feisty challenges, um, but um, it's you know we've got thousands of school kids come through. We have programs that we run um, when school's not in session, and that is where the public goes as well. They go to the aviary, and we need to improve accessibility with the pathway. Mm -hmm. We need to improve signage. So right now our signage basically says this is Trinity or this is Millie and it talks about that individual bird. I think we're missing a massive opportunity to talk about the threats to raptors and birds of prey. Um, we need to talk about rodenticides, which are, you know, the leading cause of death for owls outside of car strikes. Um, what people can be doing better, what the habitat requirements are, what conservation really looks like for birds of prey. And as an aviary, I think that's an essential part of the experience for people is to come through and not only have that intimate interaction with these animals, to, but to walk out being really clear about what they can do in their lives, mm -hmm. small and large, to protect uh, these animals in the wild. So it's an incredibly unique um, resource that we have in our town. We know that our town loves it. It is the number one thing people talk about when they come. Um, and it's a one-time ask that we're, that we're asking the town to support the investment of this long-term resource. No, thank you. And, um, you know, when, when uh, you came to us, I, I, obviously we have to look at everything very closely, and there's a lot of requests that come throughout the town at various, our department heads and also our our nonprofits, but this is a real jewel. I mean, I my son is 38, but when he went through the program, he, he just became so interested in birds, and you know, we took it to another level. Like we, I went out and bought 
um, birding books from the Audubon, and we would identify birds in the backyard. And we, mm. even to this day, he knows the names, you know, Titmouse and Chickadee. And so he knows the birds. And, and it's really, it's, it's become, um, I think, even more a passionate hobby for people mm -hmm. because of the changes to what's going on, to, to your point, um, yeah. having birds getting um, even the light, the light sensitivity yeah, and yeah. all of that. Yeah. And I just think it's a, it's a real treasure for our community to have that opportunity for our students to learn more. And God bless you for taking care of them. Um, to ra which one did you raise from? Uh, pretty much all of them. All of them? We have now, yeah, Millie I raised for 22 weeks. Um, and then the other ones were about a year old because they were all native to Connecticut sure. and they were hit in Connecticut. So they come at a young age. So all the birds that come through us, we have to train. There is a huge process, right. USDA and federal license as well so there is a huge training so pretty much all of them but the turkey vulture yeah <laughs> yeah so we had an opportunity to raise um one of the connor uh parrots remember when they were really prevalent in, in yes. fairfield yeah and one had fallen out of a nest and of course my son was like you know and it had a little concussion and it, we had no feathers yeah. and we went through the whole process of taking care of it I, I can't not believe the amount of work oh it's yes. a, yeah to take care of a young bird like that the the, the details and the mm -hmm. mixing the powder and the yep. feeding and how you feed and yeah. but it was it was a great experience my son and I did it together and it oh, was a great. really yeah. great experience um, but I, I know it's a lot of work yeah so, and that's a point where we have a lot of volunteers who help mm -hmm. us with the birds, and um, we have a junior natural mm -hmm. animal care yeah, program right. where we're teaching um, the next generation of caregivers mm -hmm. for these birds how right. to take care of these birds. Yeah. Um, and as Amy noted, with like rodenticides, really what are, what's important is also letting them know what the significance of the birds, how they are in the environment. Like they do, you know, they kill rodents. Right. Um, so, like, we want these birds in our community because they do control the rodent populations in the community. So it's, it's really important for people to see the birds up close mm -hmm. and personal. And Amy noted we have six birds. We actually have nine aviaries, but because our aviaries really do need maintenance. They do. We can't add three and more birds, birds at this point and have the safe, mm -hmm. be able to be safely moving birds and protecting them. No, it's tired and it 100% yeah. it, it needs an upgrade. I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions. Tom? Yeah, good, good morning. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, a couple of things. Uh, Appreciate, Brenda, all that you said uh, regarding your experience there. I like the idea that I think we've done this in the past. We've partnered with some of our um, not-for-profit agencies to help them with individual projects that they have. I'm questioning, uh, Brenda and Jared, have we, um, from the previous times that we've done that, if we brought the funding requests back down in line with their prior operating funding requests. I, I see, and I'm not to pick on anybody, but I thought I remember that we had funded something with Sullivan McKinney in prior years, uh, and then that w project was supposed to be over, so I would have thought that the funding would go back down to kind of historic levels. Am, am I missing something with that one? <clears throat> so um, Sullivan McKinney, that one, Frank, is is down, right? Their their request is down, and they and we've treated them all differently. Um, some of them have been project based. Uh, I believe Sullivan McKinney was one of them, and um, the project that they're doing this year is is going to be down from what they were requesting last year. Um, but others are, uh, you know, have been uh, were th were thought to be, and we considered them to be. Uh, not necessarily one-time increases, but uh, but permanent increases. But there hasn't been. I thought when we talked about yeah, I thought when we talked about Sullivan, McKinney that that the entirety of that increase and maybe my memory fails me was for the project that they were doing and we approved it based That's on that right. project and that was one time. Right for Sullivan. Just go back. For so, Sullivan McKinney, and they have a project that comes up every year. Right. So each year find. it's a little different, Tom. If you remember. Um, you know, one year, it, no, it, it, so each year, it, you know, the, and during the last three years we've been dealing with um, their budgets, you know, one year the, the fund is a certain amount because um, 
they they have um, you know maybe they need to fix a, a doors or they need to fix this or they need to fix that. It's always associated with some sort of upgrade or uh, repair project. Uh, I think one year it was the boiler or something to that nature. Um, so yes, that's been the case. In this case, Audubon, you know, we give them a specific amount like we do all the nonprofits, but this year they asked for an additional uh, amount to go toward this rehabilitation. And, and do you want to talk about how much the total rehabilitation is going to be? Sure. So we are projecting, we have a, a full project budget of 300000 uh, That is based on uh, the quotes that we've gotten thus far um, that are approximately 25000 per aviary. And as Joyce said, we have nine aviaries. So nine enclosures, separate enclosures in one, you know, sort of full aviary area. So that is 225,000. And then we have additional um, line items. We've got fencing. So right now the external fencing is really uh, sort of worn, well-worn and well-loved, we'll call it. Uh, so $15,000 for that. We've got pathway landscaping and lighting for 45,000 and signage for 15,000. So that's the total $300,000 projected budget. Again, a couple things to note, really important that for that pathway, that we want to make that accessible. Right now, it's just um, basically dirt. open dirt, yeah, <laughs> which makes it very wood chips very complicated in the winter when it's icy. Can get extremely muddy. Our jet, our whole area is, you know, in some various d degrees of wetlands or wet areas, um, and so we want a pathway that is weather resistant for all seasons and really accessible. And some of you may know this, but we have um, the ADA approved. Chabucas Trail in, uh, sorry, accessible. accessible trail that's in our, um, our, uh, our sanctuary, and that is incredibly well used, and I think, uh, and well loved by strollers and wheelchairs and people of, of all abilities. It's really important, I think, for us to be able to extend that to our visitors to go safely into the aviary. Um, so the pathway, you know, we, that's why there's a large nugget um, for the budget for the, for the pathway and landscaping sure. and lighting. Sure. And, and let me be clear, I'm not questioning, you know, the, the, the project nor the service you provide. In fact, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in public-private partnerships because, quite frankly, I, I think that in many instances the, the private organizations do a much better job managing them than, than government can do, right? So, so I'm a firm believer in, in partnering with that so that you can provide the, the services for the town. What I was really questioning is I want to make sure when we do these things, um, you know, we, we tend to augment the operating budgets and then we can fund individual projects. I, I don't like the concept of having kind of uh, recurring, non-recurring projects that we just fund, right? That we actually, we, we agree to an amount to fund the operations on an annual basis. And then these, these discrete projects, I, I think a few years ago, we, we did something with a Pequot library relative to a roof. Um, that we take those projects much like we do the town's not recurring and, and evaluate them on the merits as opposed to just uh, making it part of their annual funding. So I don't have a problem with supporting this. Um, in general, I would say, too, our, our funding of our not-for-profits here, if you back out the private, uh, private school buses, um, it's coming up on $900,000 uh, that the town is, is giving to these not-for-profits in general. And again, and I think that's a good thing. I wonder if we have the most efficient tax structure for our um, for our uh, townspeople, for our taxpayers. Uh, I note that at one point the, the town set up a 501c3 um, organization relative to servicing COVID and working with our not-for-profits. And I think just overall the town ought to look at how we're managing our relationships here and make sure we're doing it in the best way possible for the taxpayers as well as for these organizations. Like I said, I'm, I'm not against the funding. I, I'm questioning the way we administer it sometimes, that's all. Mm -hmm. So I wish you the best of luck with your project. I, I too enjoy going over to the Audubon and, and walking and, and will greatly appreciate the ease with being able to walk <laughs> on smoother surfaces <laughs> as we move Good. forward. Good. Good. So. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Nancy, do you would you like to make any comments or qu ask any questions? Can you hi? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. I'm going to go. I have 
unforeseen circumstances this morning, which prevented me from being on time to see you in person. So forgive me for that. But um, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I, too, have enjoyed the benefits of having the center uh, close by and, and part of the town. And um, my kids are loving it as well. And we still make uh, use of the paths. And my questions... Tom, I, I want to echo what you just said in terms of the broader conversation around not-for-profits, but I'm going to put a pin in that and focus instead my comments right now on the Audubon. And I'm just curious, um, you mentioned so many amazing program uh, programs and things that you do to um, that the community takes part of. So a $30,000 ask from the town actually seems like a relatively small ask, and I know it's to cover the CAME program for the third graders. But can you talk about your other funding sources, how you operate, um, and is the $45,000 in addition that you're asking today, um, and I don't have the budget book in front of me, although I will in five minutes, um, is that full additional money going towards the aviary project? Um, does it? What's the reporting structure for that? And maybe that's a, a Jared question. Um, but is $30,000 enough? from the town, um, and then again, how do you make up for that difference uh, funding-wise? I don't need a handle question. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, and I have thoughts too, but yeah, no. go for it. Sorry, there was, a lot, there was a lot there, so I can take it piece by piece if you want. No, um, that, that's fine. So. Um, the overall in town in for our Fairfield region, our budget is approximately half a million dollars. Um, we're able to serve the third graders in the Fairfield region, and we have a couple of other grade levels that do single classes with us, but not entire grade levels. And so we ha we do seek other private funding, and overall we raise about two hundred thousand dollars a year to provide educational programming across the entire Fairfield County region, um, but. It includes Fairfield, the town of Fairfield. Um, we also have, you know, our private donors, and we hold events and other programs. Um, but I, again, it's a it is a community resource. So um, yeah, there's there's a big need, um, and thirty thousand dollars basically funds all of the third graders, um, which historically the funding that we requested did not. It only covered ninety percent of the third graders, and we always went to seek that last ten percent. But we worry, especially during the pandemic, of what would have happened if we couldn't have come up with that last 10 percent, and then you would have an inconsistent experience for third graders. Um, so we're committed to try and continuing to serve, uh, and we really appreciate the town support to make sure that we can provide for the third graders. Um, over and above that, I would say that um, you know the support for the aviaries that $45,000 is for the aviary project, and it really will be used to meet immediate um, renovation needs. Um, as we noted, the aviaries are 40 years old, and we are not using three of them because they're just not safe. Um, so we really do need to address that. But we will use that funding to leverage additional funding sources from individual donors and other foundations so that we can reach our $300,000 goal and really make that a show place for the town of Fairfield, something that people really will come from greater areas um, and build a lot more of an economic build around that. Thank you. I, I, yeah, thank you, Joyce. I will add to that only to say that we really felt like the aviaries is a big priority, and that was why we did the focus of 30 for for the third grade, for, for our CAME program, and 45 is a one-time capital for the aviaries. To be totally honest, going forward, once that aviary is in the condition that we sort of envision and running to, to capacity, I would love to consider other programs that the town could um, slash should be supporting because of sort of the extended programming, programming that we do offer in the community and a lot of the visions that we have for making um, uh, additional uh, sort of family-friendly opportunities to come and learn about all sorts of things at Audubon. We are a great place to be hosting yeah. information about recycling, information about pollinator pathways, and everybody is coming to us saying, can we host these things? Those things cost money for us. And so I think long-term, we will look for ways to try and lean on the town to support us as we grow those public education opportunities. No, that's great. Um, 
and, and to Nancy's point, you know, obviously this is, and, and to Tom's, this is an asset to our community. It's utilized um, not just by young people, but adults as well. And I think making, like we did, to Tom's point, we made a similar investment um, into the Pequot Library. It's used by our community. It's a third library. We don't have to pay for it. And, but we use it. And it's the same thing. The Audubon is an asset to our community. You have a capital project. It's under, Pequot was a little different because it was a higher amount. Um, and we had to be more creative. But this is under 100,000, which typically is the tipping, um, you know, a tipping point for a non reoccurring capital project. But I think it also sends a message to others who you're going to be fundraising from that the town is committed to this. Um, facility and that we care about it and I think that helps you in your fundraising efforts as well. One hundred percent. Sure. A little bit about the timing and um, because I do think that this kind of getting that becomes contagious and then the town will, uh, the, the residents will see that the town is invested. So what does it look like in terms of timeline and what the immediate next steps are to use that 45 and uh, well, that's a very good question. So for the, the primary um, sort of launch point for us is that we are in the process of completing an engineering study with Huntington, who's actually doing a full evaluation of uh, the entire nature center, the center at Fairfield, because long term we're doing some building remodeling renovations. And so we need the results of that engineering study. It was supposed to have been a, a completed a couple of months ago. So that's, you know, that should be do, done at any point. Um, in the very near future, and that will help us really determine the overall landscape of the air, of the aviary, and um, you know we've really allow us to sort of determine exactly what our our vision looks like for the remodel. So we've got, um, as you, some of you may know, but Jack Franzen is on our board, and um, we will leverage Jack's knowledge as we do with the building to help us put together the plans for the aviary remodel. Um, and oh hi! I was talking loudly. And we had to move things around because Board of Ed is taking <laughs> that whole spot. Nancy's Nancy's in the house. Um, <laughs> okay, Nancy. Yeah. Like a hurricane. Sorry about that. No problem. Oh, welcome. Um, so, uh, it, we need the Huntington study done, and um, and then I think uh, we will in sh really determine exactly what the full um, plan looks like, and we've already started those conversations. We've got additional grants going out next week. Uh, to support the aviary, and we've got um, uh, meetings with Ring's End, who are asking to do some in-kind donations to support the renovation. They seem extremely interested in that. Um, so my my goal, I mean, I'm looking at this as a sooner rather than later. I'd like to start construction this year. I just need yeah. the aviary. I need yeah. the, uh, the, the study to be done. Well, I, I think it's great. And as the first select woman said, the fact that you know people will see that the town is invested and yeah. I'm personally excited to be invested, so um, good luck, and I can't wait to visit those birds. <laughs> and then I do have a Jared question, I think. Just in terms of the accounting, is it how does that work when we give for a capital project with a not-for-profit? Is there a requirement to report in, or is there a reporting structure? Does the Audubon come back to us to kind of give us a, an update on progress? I mean, I would like it personally anyway, because it's great. Can, but we, can we do it as a site visit? So you could, <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have you. That would be awesome. Yeah, we always get a, a report when it's a capital project like this. We always get a report from the uh, nonprofit at some point throughout the year when the project's going on. Come and see us, and we'll come see you. <laughs> yeah, and we have partnered with the town in other ways through community development block grant funding, and um, yeah. yeah, we're always happy to have the town come by and see us. Absolutely. Thanks. Great. I would look forward to to getting out of town hall for a little bit. <laughs> it would be. I would love to host you all. And um, you can see the birds up person up close and personal. We've got beavers on the property right now. We've got um, Nancy. We've got barred owls, wild barred owls that are sitting they, outside, they nesting they right outside. Oh, the really? They are there all the time. Oh. Right on the trail, this big fat girl. Oh, it's awesome. Oh my so God! Come visit. That must really be nice. Awesome. That must be really nice. Yeah. Hey, Jared, just to get back to, could you report back to us on stuff that was included in prior years' budgets relative to capital projects for the other not-for-profits, please, just so that we have that? 
Sure. So you you just want what do you want? You want sorry. You just I want to know um, in twenty two and twenty three if there were any other um, not for profits that got capital project funding that's included on these numbers. Yeah, I mean, we, we had Sullivan, we know that Sullivan McKinney yeah. had one and, and they're doing a smaller one this year, so their, their amount has gone down. Um, but yeah, we can, uh, we can look into those details and get you that information. Yep. Can you remind awesome. me the page that... 99. 99. Okay, I just wanted to look one thing and it's more of a CFO question. Okay, 99. no other questions. Okay. All right. Seeing no further questions. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. It's really nice so to see you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate your time. Appreciate yours too. Nancy, thank you. I put a um, piece. There's an Audubon piece. Oh, well, thank you. Do you need any more of them for people? Um, you know, if you want to leave them, I can put them up in the um, uh, for Slack Woman's office. People come in. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. Sorry, it came in like your hurricane in the middle of your presentation. Uh, so next up um, on our agenda is uh, the Penfield Pavilion Complex. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Calabrese. This is on page 194. Hi, Anthony. Well, well, good morning, everybody. Um, morning. Anthony Calabrese, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, you will see the Penfield uh, Pavilion Complex budget before you on page 195. Um, you will see that the way the budget um, was prepared was with the assumption that the building would be closed and under construction uh, slash remediation. Um, so you do see an overall uh, decrease of a dollar amount of about 55000 and change, um, which is a 27% decrease. Um, happy to walk through any questions. And we're just discussing Penfield, not overall parks and rec. Yeah, we go all seven budgets one by one. <laughs> so, Anthony, Anthony, how much did we take out in revenue related to this? I don't have the revenue number right at my fingertips. Uh, well, we're budgeting zero for the lockers. We're budgeting zero for the concession stand and zero for Penfield rental. So the only revenue we're budgeting for in this budget is the Jackie Durrell Pavilion, which is a slight slight increase. We're looking at about two hundred eight thousand dollars. So what's the what's the downside on the other revenues coming out? What's the number, Jared? If you have it, somebody has it. I can. One second. Thank you. Yes, a second. It's one hundred ninety-eight thousand. So we lost. We're taking out one hundred ninety-eight k year over year and we're only able to take out expenses of 55. Why, why is part-time payroll going up so high? Uh, part-time payroll, so again, we're budgeting for 150 parties at the Jackie Durrell Pavilion, so that still has to be staffed accordingly. Um, we still are accounting for staffing um, some maintenance. There will still be maintenance staff that needs to be on site during the summer, and we're still budgeting for parking because people will still be using the beach that will be open. Granted, you'll see a decrease in the parking revenue when we get to the waterfront budget, um, but we did try to account for that. Yeah, so why did the – I understand everything that you just said, but why is it going up by 46% on the part-time side? It's really just the way that we uh, staff the, the parties. Um, we really look at the part-time payroll and the seasonal payroll as, as almost one line item. It's the same kids that are working in most cases, um, whether they're working the parking or they're working an event. Um, and that's, that's all it was. Yeah, but why would it grow so much? I, I, I understand all that, and I understand how you're managing it but I don't understand the year-over-year -year growth. Sure. Part of, part of it is due to increased minimum wage, obviously not all of it. Um, but the breakout on this, again, is for 150, the part-time specifically, is for 150 events at Penfield um, with staffing one assistant director there and one attendant, eight hours times 150 events. And then we also built in hours for tours, um, 104 hours for tours at the $20 an hour. Um, because people still do want to tour the facility, or if they've already booked it, they still want to get in there and take a peek at the facility with their event planners and uh, see the space. And obviously, we've got to have staff on site to do that. 
Yeah, it's still t- a- a- again we're taking one building offline for an entire summer. And I'm going to look because it's what you said. I'm going to look at part time and seasonal as one line item. Sure. And we're we're roughly flat, right? Or no, we're down by. Okay, we're down by down by a lot. Five. Yep. I get it. Okay. I'm looking at the percentages. Okay. Hang on here. We're down 50 and we're up 16. Got it. And you're saying it's because of that. Okay. Utilities, you're in half. You're coming down that. You're coming down. I'm surprised we don't. I'm just a little surprised we don't have more savings on the bottom line given what we're taking out in revenue. That's all. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the other, th- other things that are in here, obviously, are cleaning supplies and things of that nature. And all those prices have gone up 8 to 12%. So, unfortunately, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, compare to last year's numbers. Right. Okay. Thank you for the answer. You're welcome. Um, so, I'm just looking, cause, because you take each department or each subdivision... Uh, it's probably more of an overall overarching to me. And I, again, it's just the way I was looking at it. It's just a suggestion that is maybe unsolicited. But the it's confusing to see this before this sort of description and understanding. Because so that may just be a budget book thing. Um, because it'd be nice to be able to see it because the supplies and the maintenance and all those things have gone up. It, um, to look at it across departments. Um, because those seem to be the single dr- biggest drivers, obviously, other than salary, um, in terms of the changes. So uh, just wanting to make sure that you're looking holistically, as I'm sure you are, but it would be good to hear that, just in terms of the way you can um, consolidate and share or have office supplies go across um, all the different verticals. And like postage, for instance, what on the waterfront side. Yep, those are mailing all the beach stickers. Okay, so um, again, just being able to look at it more holistically would be helpful, but I appreciate that it has to be broken out for purposes of the, the single line items. But it, again, to look at it overall, mm-hmm. it's just it's confusing. Yeah, no, completely understand. And I, I think that I could speak from... I don't like to speak for other departments, but I think I can speak for most of the departments. Um, things like postage and um, office supplies, you know, those all go out through, they go through our purchasing department and they get bid as a bulk sum. So we're all ordering from the same companies, um, you know, whether it's WB Mason or whatever our mail company is at the time. But um, they are, I, so I, I do want to agree that, yes, they are looked at holistically, even though they're broken out yeah. individually here. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, You know, Tom, you started to ask this in terms of just operationally, other than the building being closed and having to adjust for revenue, are there other things that, and again, it may not be your, the discussion for this, um, that we need to be thinking about just in terms of what, how that is going to be impacted, operating otherwise? Yeah. I I, I heard Tom asking specific questions, but... Are there I, things we should be thinking about overall? Well, I, I think the overall stuff that we should be thinking about is the the future of the Penfield Pavilion. Obviously, this budget goes into effect July 1 of 23 and runs through June 30th of 24. So um, we're trying to project what we're going to be doing with that pavilion. Obviously, I attended the uh, the FEMA meeting last night, and you know, I understand where they stand, um, and I understood where the, the – the community stands with that. So obviously now we're kind of just, I don't want to say we're in a holding pattern, but it's it kind of like we're, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, so it seems like we're in a, a bit of a holding pattern for the time being, but obviously if something were to change and other decisions were made, again, I'm not going to predict what the other bodies are going to decide to do, but that would be something that could change this budget drastically. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously if everybody was just like, Hey, reopen the building and we're not going to worry about what FEMA says, well, then some of these numbers go up on the expense side. Some of them you know, potentially go up on the, re- I would hope, on the revenue side since we're at all zeros. But those are really the, the, the bigger changes. As far as operationally, um, you know, we're doing our best. And I'll talk, about, I'll talk to it during the waterfront portion when we start talking about beach parking. But that's more of, 
how are we going to operate the beach? You know, how do we make the assumption of, you know, and I use this assumption that we're going to lose 10% of the beachgoers to Penfield. Again, I'm basing that on my historic knowledge of the last time we went through this process and the building sat closed for five years with a fence around it and, you know, how few people were using the beach. Um, it didn't stop everybody from going. I mean, there were still people that went, but you know, when we didn't have a concession there and we tried bringing food trucks in and you know, they flopped. Um, not saying that would be the case, you know, now again, that we're almost 10 years past the last time we did this, but um, those are some of the operational issues that I've just tried to work through. But I'm happy to, when we get to the waterfront budget, I could delve into it a little deeper, I guess. Uh, um, all right, and I will put a pin in it, but Jared, I would love you at some point to just walk us through what would happen if there what if we had to have a process of what that looks like of drastically having to change or respond just so we can say it out loud, but what that would look like if the budget is passed and then all of a sudden we have to go back in and just would love to hear that, so. But can that's you, not, you, yeah, what do you mean more, by, meaning if, if we have to all of a sudden what the timeline might look like and how it's going to impact it. because presumably some decisions will have to be made before the budget closes so what does that look like um, just in terms of deadlines and based on the conversations that were being had last night so basically well last night was um, I think a very um, while some somewhat tense at times um, was a good uh, opportunity for the community to see where we stand where FEMA stands and um, I was very clear last night saying I am moving forward with a proposal uh, through the funding bodies. Uh, we're gonna put it together because we have a clock ticking and, and we're gonna put it forward. And so regardless of what happens, we have to clean soil under that building. That's a no brainer. Um, we know that. And what happens to the building it, um, is gonna happen to the building depending on what the funding bodies um, agree to. <coughs> but, Excuse me. It, you know, it won't be open. And we're hoping to just not have one, we're hoping to just have one season of it not being open. Right. And, and then next year we'll have the discussion if there's something that goes astray, if the building uh, has to go longer than the 12 to 15 months that was projected, uh, then we, you know, we'll pick up then. Yeah, and with some deadlines looming, and I was listening and some of the volume was hard, so I'm gonna have to go back and listen to the recording. Um, it seems like it might overlap with the timing of the budget process still going on. Would we, um, would that impact, is, the, is that true? That the timeline of some of the deadlines, if we, if we are working against that, would coincide with the Board of Finance still looking at the budget? Based on what well, you Well, the, 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 the operating budget isn't gonna change, okay. um, so to speak. Th this would be a capital expense. Okay, so but that's, you're confident in that? won't change regardless of what, okay. I mean, if, if, there, if there were operating, we would treat it like we do anything else that comes up in the middle of the budget process and uh, make changes, suggest changes, I mean, things propose change, them, yeah. and if they happen, then we'll, we'll update um, just as we've done in every year in the past. Okay. I just wanted to have that Right, and, I mean, hopefully, you know, listen, the whole plan for me, and I outlined this last night, was, you know, I'd like to get the, um, I'd like to address the notices of violation. Uh, well, we are addressing the notice of violation for the soil. Um, I'd like to address the notice of violation for FEMA. Um, and I have shared this with FEMA privately and publicly that I would hopefully get the approvals in process, uh, approvals finished by the town bodies. And then we would, uh, and I told this to FEMA, would like to start at the end of this summer to avoid having our community have two summers um, and then have it completed before the next, you know, so that's, we would lose next summer. And listen, if, we, if we're gonna on the fly, like if it works out, um, because we wanna do the soil and the Penfield Pavilion at the same time, that would be the optimum and most common sense cost-effective way to do this, um, and, and least disruptive to the neighborhood and community at large. Um, but if we, for example, um, just let me finish, Tom. So, for example, if if we do get those approvals and we're going to do it in the at the end of the summer, maybe we would be able to open it up a little bit to utilize it. You know, it would be kind of last minute, but somebody wants to have a reunion or somebody wants to have a, a anniversary party or something. I don't think that's going to be significant revenue because um, you know things changed. But who knows? It might happen. 
Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, quick question for you. I, even if all that happens, right, the, the, realistically here, whatever happens during this, this discussions in March, you're not going to be opening the pavilion this summer, right? No, what I said was I would like to begin the work, and I've shared this with FEMA as well, that if we get right. it through, I would like to begin it at the end of the summer. Because if we did it this summer, we could potentially lose two seasons with a construction site. Yeah, but I guess, so So my apologies. So then let me go back a second. Regardless of whether the funding gets approved or not, do you plan on opening this summer or no? Hmm. I don't know, Tom, because... You know, there's a lot of uh, balls in the air. I mean, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to last night's meeting, but I did. Okay, I did. so I we're did. we have very few options just, here: um, either knock the building down to be in compliance with uh, the NOV, or fix the gray beans um, and the elevation. So, uh, you right. know, I don't I, I know. Guess what I'm, where I'm getting confused is you're you're absolutely right, and I listen to it and I understand what the options are. What, what's confusing me is it, it's it's and the reason for my question is regardless of what the answer is in March, whether we decide to knock it down or decide to, to rebuild or what have you, um, anything you're going to do, I would guess, from what, what you're saying, would probably not start until fall. Correct. I would like it to be. So I mean, that hasn't been determined right. yet. We're still in negotiations with FEMA, still having discussions. Um, right. But... So if so if that were the case, though, should we be planning on and budgeting as though, regardless of the outcome of that, at least for this season, Penfield's going to remain open? Um, I'm, I'm, Anthony, I'm not suggesting that you'll be able to rent it out or anything, but maybe the lockers and maybe, you know, it changes your staffing assumptions, too. I don't I don't know. That That's kind of where I'm going. Right. But, like, I think this was another item we were discussing the other day. I think it was... Um, some item you discussed, uh, budget, I can't remember uh, which budget item it was, but similar to what we were discussing the other day, if something, you know, changes, we can always adjust during the budget process, uh, Board of Finance, um, and if it happens after the fact, we can just um, work with the Board of Finance to make transfers, should they be needed. Right. Well, this wouldn't even be, I, I mean, to be honest, this wouldn't even be transfers. This could be, and really, you're, since the Board of Finance is the only one that can add to the budget without, you know, going through the whole rigmarole of a process, um, you know, if, in fact, regardless of what the decision is on Penfield, we have the opportunity to open it and make some money and have the, the, uh, the public use it for the summer, maybe we ought to be planning for that for just for this summer because it seems as though, and, and I support your your commentary. Um, there's no reason to lose two summers, regardless of the um, regardless of the outcome. Right. So, so uh, obviously, this is a very unusual situation what we're dealing with. Um, yep. And you know, I, I mean, honestly, Tom, I don't know. And I think if we end up doing having to, uh, the ability to rent it out a bit and get a little funds, it will go into the it'll go into the general fund, and it will end up as surplus. It. Yeah, so, so that we could that, use toward the fill pile. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not like we uh, don't have places to use this money. Um, we have no, plenty, no, no. plenty of them. It's very fair. So maybe, you know, and I'm not pretending that this can be done for Monday, but it's a very fair conversation. And Anthony, you know, my request would be that you develop a contingency plan, right? As though you are going to open it this summer and what does that look like a very realistic contingency plan not that we're looking to pad any revenues or anything like that but just saying hey if regardless of whether it's going to be torn down or it's going to be rebuilt that's not going to happen until after labor day let's say you know what does that look like what is the financial implication on the budget so that the board of finance can review that and and maybe at that point by the time that's moving through brenda you'll have a better better view on it um just an opportunity right I mean yeah absolutely listen I we do this stuff all the time you know when things change on the ground you know we'll call an emergency staff meeting we'll sit down we'll work things out um, and then come before whatever body would be um, 
you know, appropriate at the time. Uh, but it's so, there's so many balls in the air right now. I mean, I guess Anthony could put together a contingency plan, but I don't even know, uh, you know, we don't really, uh, we don't know. Oh, I, I could put together a contingency plan. Again, this budget starts July 1, so really the locker revenue is probably not going to change. Uh, most We always rent our lockers out in March. So that revenue, if we were to open up for this summer, that revenue would actually go into the current year's budget, so it would have no effect on next year's budget. The concession number, um, we'd get half the year's concession because half, would, again, would be paid in the current budget. Half would be, so I mean, we're talking $18,000. And then, you know, maybe we say it's a nominal two or three parties for actual rentals, so maybe we're making another ten or 15000 there. You know, so I mean, I, total revenue side of things, I mean, we're probably talking less than $30,000. Yeah, it's not. Um, and the expense side of it, too, you know, it's probably in that range. Again, I'd, I would have to put that together, so happy to do that for Monday for you guys, but, I mean, when we're talking $30,000 of revenue, $30,000 worth of expenses, again, ballpark figures, in a three hundred and sixty million dollar budget, or whatever we're up to now, yeah. um, that make I leave that to you guys. Sense, but okay, <laughs> that doesn't make sense to you. No, uh, it doesn't make sense to me with how much the pavilion costs to run that we wouldn't get a bit more money out of it from that from having it open. I understand we wouldn't be able to rent a, rent it a lot, but I would think we'd be able to rent it some, and I would think we'd get a lot more from concessions from being open versus being closed. Well, the cons- but I the would think it, yeah, you'd have to staff it a bit. Sure. Uh, so well, let me yeah. just let me just try to clarify this we don't for need you. To have this discussion now, but well, I don't want to have it on Monday, so I'd rather have it now. Yeah, go ahead, um, Anthony. So I mean, the concession is is a contract, right? Goes out to bid. We have that contract. We have the vendor already under contract. So if his, I'm just going to use thirty six thousand dollars because that's the number that's in my head, but I think it's around that. So if he's paying eighteen thousand in May and then eighteen thousand in July. We're going to recognize 18000 We have nothing to do with staffing that. We have nothing to do with any other part of that. It's completely leased out. He runs his own thing. We see the 18000 So, I mean, that's actual revenue that we would see. Is that 18000 a month or 18000 every how many months? He pays it twice a season. So it's $36,000 for the summer. Again, I might be off a couple thousand here or there, but it's in. it was definitely in the 30s. Um, locker rooms. Again, we bring in about $26,000, $27,000 a year normally on that. But again, we do that registration in March. So that would be recognized revenue in the current budget and not for this budget that we're looking at. This budget would look at March of next year, which we would not be selling lockers for. Uh, Penfield Rentals. 80% of our rentals are residents. On a Saturday night, prime time, you're paying $3,500 for a rental fee. Again, we normally would book this out two years in advance. Nobody's booking their wedding here in February for this summer. Um, again, unless they unless they rented the place in, uh, in uh, Milford that they're building right now, that's not going to be open. I know people are scrambling right now for other venues there. But um, you, again, so I was just thinking when we were just talking about this off the back of the napkin, you know, if we picked up two or three of those parties, you know, again, we're to, I think I even said maybe ten or 15000 which was five or six parties. But um, I don't see us getting more than that. Um, that's not to say the building shouldn't be open if it's available. Again, the RTM, it was nice having public meetings there. Uh, you guys are kind of a small board. But again, I liked having the RTM meetings there. I liked being able to have the health department host meetings there yeah, um, in getting use out of that facility. It's, it is a beautiful facility, but when we're talking revenue, on this short of notice, there's not a ton to be made. Can I ask a clarifying question? Because there's so much back and forth, I don't even know where we've landed <laughs> in all of this. So I understand that in an ideal world, you're waiting till after the summer. When is that? determined. So because wouldn't that determine whether or not you can open or not open and this would be moved? Well, so this we... budget, as I think Anthony was trying to illustrate, this budget is not for this year. It's for next year. Okay. So so next year, it definitely won't be open. Right. So that's why I'm saying. So why are we going through that well, exercise? 
Sorry, yeah. no offense. So no, I'm just no, trying to understand. no. But to Tom's point, it, this budget does cover half the summer, right? So as of right. July, so July right. one through, through Labor August, Day. Yeah. You know, we would have staff on site. If we did have an event, I would have to staff it. I'm going to need maintenance staff. If we were to open the lockers, I've got to account for having somebody sit there for the 12 hours a day. Right. So to um, his point, that we would need that information because that is, seems like it's more reflective of the reality than not. Yeah, no, no, I'm not disagreeing right. with, okay. with, with Tom's point of doing the exercise, going through the exercise. I'm just making the point in the overall budget of $360 million it's small, is $30,000 worth it's got it. very I just small got, doing. Sorry, and again, I, got lost I have, in all of I have no issue okay. doing it. I can get that together yeah. you know, for Monday, not a problem. But it's not going to have a huge impact on I the get overall it. budget. Okay. Sorry, it was just a lot. I didn't know where we were, so I just wanted to level set. All right. Uh, do, you, do we have any other questions on any of the other items, uh, as you can see on the um, on the agenda? So we have recreation, waterfront, parks, marina, golf course, um, and then the page numbers just for your uh, edification. Recreation has 197 page, waterfront 202, parks 204, marina 208, and then the golf course, 214. Yeah, I just had And then the revenue pages are on 17 and 18. That's helpful. Yeah, I just have two final questions. Sure, go ahead. For all of your things, because I took out my highlighter, um, I just had two questions. Can you explain what the contracted property services line item is and the, um, you already explained the materials for maintenance or repair, because those seem to be the highest. But again, you've explained the increase and that you're looking at it holistically, but on page 205 under parks. Yep. Can you just talk about what that is? Yes, contracted property services in parks. Um, that is broken out into a couple different things. Um, primarily um, about $780,000 is per our contract with Greenway Property Services for all the athletic field maintenance um, and mowing of our um, islands and things of that nature. Um, we have 137,000, which is actually the islands and the properties, not the athletic parts of that, um, which is with Greenway as well. And then we have about a, a little more than $100,000 for irrigation repairs. Um, majority of our athletic fields do have um, irrigation and heads break all the time or pipes freeze or crack or need to be replaced. So um, that those three are what make up that contracted property services item. And I feel like we discussed this last year, but if you could remind me, the reason we, um, and maybe we looked at it in an informed way, which I don't remember, uh, bringing that 780000 in-house. Yeah. Um, so we have had this conversation, um, and I recently, I think it was a Board of Finance meeting a few weeks ago or in December, um, I was actually handed the audit that was done of that that line item uh, back in 2020 before I took this department over. But I just got that report, like I said, in December or January. Um, so I've had time to look over it. Um, the report does suggest that we potentially could be saving money by bringing majority of these services back in-house with exception of um, the, the mowings around town, the islands, and things of that nature. Um, that's the 130k. Yeah. 780k. But the 780 will be able to bring back. We should be able to bring back in house at one point. However, um, in that audit, it was recommending that all that work can be completed by three employees, three additional employees, um, onto the seven that we have in parks now. Um, I don't feel, having run this for a little more than a year now, um, that that's accurate. I think the number is more like six guys, um, six employees, and that was that would be what I would request. And those are the conversations I've had behind the scenes already with um, with the administration, saying if I was to do this, I'd be coming to ask for six. So I have not had a chance yet to have um, our finance department run those numbers with six employees, six additional employees, to see what the true savings would be. So to that. Jared, is that the kind of thing that we could get before Monday to understand? An additional six employees? Well, you were just saying you haven't run the numbers to see, so. Yeah, I, I don't know. Huh, I, I don't know. That, it's a little more complicated. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that they can produce the numbers as 
quickly as Monday. Right, but it's, but that's what I would be. I mean, it's something we're looking at. We we've, we've started looking at, but it it needs. I mean, you're and, talking. You're adding. Uh, you know, union employees with yeah. benefits. No, 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 I appreciate all the I know thing. what goes into it. Yeah, I'm not, so I'm just saying. Really has to be a this, and, was, this was an idea that, um, you know, that Anthony has talked about, but it wasn't something, it wasn't really, a, a, you know, an official proposal for us to analyze. Like this, this would be a, a completely new ask for this budget um, after we've already started the process. Yeah, it would have to be flushed out. It's not a non-starter. I'm just saying, I think and, and we, certainly for next now that we have this, we know it's out there. I think we need no, to look at all those things. Yeah, it's something we are gonna we, we are looking at, and during the off season, you know, after the budget process, these are the things that we, you know, sit down and, and discuss and work through. And the other the other big number that we have to also figure out again, in I would say in the off season here. Um, is what additional equipment also needs to be purchased, and how quickly can we obtain that equipment? Because a lot of the equipment, when this was all uh, outsourced, um, we no longer have, right. so or it's been allocated all other places. All the things to factor in. Yeah, exactly. Your mind. second item <laughs> was another one, but I don't think it was in this budget, right? It was in a different on a different page, or was it also no, this it was page? Really, just a general. I look again. I looked at materials for maintenance repair. Yeah, same type I of. Mean, I just think it's worth pointing out again and again because when people see it, yep. they're going to see big increases, and we just need to, you know, remind everybody across departments. Yep. All these costs are going up, but that, as you said, it goes all through purchasing, and you're looking where you can consolidate. So. Yes. I don't have any other questions. Okay, thank you. Oh, what happened? Uh, the Linux is still there. I'm trying to figure out. Oh. Is this a time to run to the ladies' room? Yeah. yeah everyone's still connected. I Hi, everyone. Hey, we got video and sounds. Yeah, everything. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Sorry, guys. Hi. Yeah, when the power went out, I like reset something. Oh, okay. Tom, are you? Can you hear us? See us? Tom's muted right now, but. He is Tom. Yes, I oh. can. Sorry, I, just, I can't see you. Right, the screen went like I don't know what happened. Um, yeah. I'm having a little... No, I can, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Um, so we're going to be breaking at 1230 for lunch and then resuming back at 1 um, p.m. And then we will be kicking off the education um, side of it. So I just want to, uh, is there any additional questions on um, uh, waterfront, parks, marina, golf course? Revenue. What's going on? Can we turn to the golf course real quick? What's going on there this year? And that's page 214 for anybody who wants to look. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep. Yep. So um, the big driver here really is just um, one line item, um, and that's capital outlay. Um, the capital outlay that we are looking for here, is, there was three items that we're carrying in there. Obviously, um, individually, they are less than the $100,000 that's required to go through the uh, non-recurring, um, so they end up being carried into our capital budget. Um, but we did budget here for uh, $55,000 for a new vehicle for the golf course superintendent. His vehicle's uh, I believe 20 years old and really uh, close to the end of its useful life. Uh, a bed knife grinder for 35000 that's used for sharpening the blades of the mowers. Um, and then a multi-seat shuttle cart, which is essentially um, essentially a uh, an extended uh, sized uh, golf cart that's used for shuttling groups of people back and forth as opposed to just two golfers. This would be used in uh, camps or you know, if we have elderly uh, uh, customers that need to be taken to different parts of the courses, this is how they would be able to travel back and forth. What's going on with uh, revenue for the golf course? What are we projecting for that? Yep, revenue um, pretty much is staying status quo here. We did go up slightly in greens fees because the Golf Commission raised the adult resident rates by a dollar a round. We do about 10,000 rounds for that bracket, so we increased by about $10,000. Um, 
the rest of them, again, I tried to use either historical data uh, with where we're going to be, and if we were close, I kept the number. If we weren't really that close, then I used a three-year average. Um, and then you'll see the concession goes up. Uh, that's the Boca uh, restaurant that's up there, and they're, by, they're going to, I guess this contract would be their third year. Maybe it covers part of their fourth year, th combination of third and fourth, I believe, um, year of their lease. I mean, your expenses went up on Richardson by 188000 What did your revenue go up by? 8000 if I'm looking at the right line. However, however, I think I should preface that with, for the past several years, we have exceeded our budget numbers. I do budget very conservatively, as I think majority of you have found out over the years. So um, will we exceed the 1.335 that I'm saying, that I'm hoping for next year? Potentially. Um, however, this golf is very weather driven and we are still coming out of COVID. So, um, COVID numbers for all golf courses across the country were really off the charts. Um, I believe at this point we've started to come back down to reality. Um, however, it's more of a flat reality. I don't know if, if we've um, reached the peak of the bell curve or if we're on the way down um, and have, have curved at, you know, hit the bottom of that curve yet. Um, but that's essentially my take on this at the moment. Prior to COVID, I believe we were only in the neighborhood of budgeting 1.1 million, and that was always pie in the sky for us. So one- It was supposed to bump up. I don't remember by how much, but it was supposed to bump up because of the new clubhouse too. Yep, and we're, we're following all those rate changes and, and we're exceeding those numbers that were presented by the building committee when they went for that funding. Far, far exceeding those numbers. Again, nobody predicted COVID, so I, I think the COVID bump was a nice thing for us. Yeah, it really was. I mean, that was out of control. Yeah, I guess where I'm looking at is, so the total golf course throws off about close to 2.3 million and you're at 1.8 million in expense, which it, it basically that gap is closing between the two. So I think we just have to look at that a bit as we move forward. Because obviously the goal is to have them be self-sufficient or better. Yep. Um, and I think that gap is narrowing now. You know, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I understand it. But I think we need to, to make sure we don't cross that Rubicon, if you know what I mean. Understood. Your annual locker fees came way down, too. Yeah. I don't understand uh, that's a, it's not a big number, but it's down a lot. Yeah, no, that, that's kind of a conundrum we're in at the moment. Um, when we opened up the new clubhouse and the bag, we say locker room, but it's really bag storage. It's in the cart barn. Um, we had always, in the old clubhouse, we had about 50 lockers in just the men's room. So the ladies never had the opportunity to have bag storage, but the men did. Um, when we put in these lockers, we put in 86 or 87 of them, and within minutes of them opening up and the building opening up, we sold out. So the first year, we we were like, wow, this is, this is fantastic. This past year, which was year two of the clubhouse, we only sold... Uh, if it was 10 or I think it's $2,000 worth of lockers, I mean, it's about 10 or 12 lockers. Um, you know, we start, we've looked at this at the golf commission and like, well, why aren't people do, re using this? And really it, it, it just comes down to, well, if they want to go play another course, they've got to come get their clubs. Sometimes the, you know, if they come after hours, the building's locked, we need to have somebody there to let them in. Um, it just wasn't as convenient as they thought it was going to be. Um, so right now what the golf commission is doing, and I haven't budgeted, for this yet because it hasn't, we haven't gotten to the point where I see it being implemented yet. Um, but they would like to convert the locker room area into um, uh, an area where you would have the indoor uh, trackman simulators. Um, however, that's a big expense. We've put it out to bid. We've gotten that number back, well over $100,000 for two different machines. Um, so I'm exploring some other options right now, some other avenues, um, specifically uh, with our, our, our lessee up there, uh, Boca, to see if they might want to partner with us, potentially front the cost for the machine so we could at least offer this amenity to the residents. 
obviously with them doing that, we don't have to um, you know, front the money for $100,000. I'd have to figure, I haven't, again, this is all still talk. Um, I have not brought this forward to anybody else yet officially. I'm, I'm still working with Boca on if they're even interested in doing something like this, you know, whether, whether there's a revenue share or what. But um, we do want to get that amenity up there. The Golf Commission is adamant about um, adding that amenity. So, Got it. Then, Anthony, one unrelated to the golf course, if my colleagues don't mind, but another area. Uh, ladies, do you mind if I ask another oh, question? Oh, of course. Go ahead. Um, the marina, Anthony. What's going on with the marina? There was a lot of talk about the marina and all sorts of plans on it, and then it kind of died down. I'd just like to know where we stand right now on it. Yeah, marina, um, we are kind of in a, I guess we're in a holding pattern, as you've heard me say with other things. Um, Right now, on the capital with the capital planning workshop, um, I've been carrying for several years, more than several now, um, a whole complete redesign, which is ex what you were just speaking to, um, where we had consultants come in, give us a whole bunch of options, sit with the community, go through them, um, try to choose one, and put a price tag on it. If I'm not mistaken, I think that price tag was in the neighborhood of $8 million. Again, this is now several years ago pre-COVID, so that number definitely has skyrocketed since. Um, but I've also carried the number to phase in replacement of the current marina, and I think I'm carrying 600000 over several fiscal years, so we can go in and replace three docks worth or so of docks, and then the next winter replace another three. But again, um, that's on the, the capital planning workshop, um, and I guess with the, the Board of Finance who just looked at that a couple weeks ago. But there's been no specific proposals brought forward right now, right? Not at the moment, correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, is there any additional questions for Anthony on any of the items? Do you? Yes. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Tom, do you have any more? Good right now. Okay. All right. Well, keep those pickleballers happy. I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> They're Anthony's best friends. Oh yeah. They email him every day. They call him. Come to my office. <laughs> they come stop by. Fun. It's fun. Lunch. They are. They are very passionate. Um, all right. Well, so um, if there's no further questions, um, I'm going to say let's break because the superintendent is to start around one. And so this will give us an opportunity to uh, go and uh, go and have lunch or do work or whatever they need to do. And um, I will see everyone back here at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and we loaded up the uh, Fairfield Public Schools uh, presentation, and we have with us the superintendent of schools, Mike Testani, and we have the vice chair, Nick Asa, and we have the administration here as well. And uh, I don't know if we have anybody on WebEx. <laughs> no. Do you want it? No, 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 don't do that. Help him. Yeah. No, 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 to the left. Right there. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Nick, I think you're going to have to give an assist. What if you hit a space button? Hold on, hold on. What are you trying to do? Zoom in? He's just trying to make it so he doesn't have to change the slides. Oh, space buttons work. Okay. Alright, we gotta go back all the way to the far left. Look at Mike's eyes are like wide, trying really hard <laughs> to see. Terrible getting old. Yeah, I know the feeling. Okay. Alright, so here we are. Okay, the presentation is up. And I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate having the opportunity. Um, I will start by saying uh, I, my 
official first day in Fairfield was November 1st, as we were getting the process started. Um, there was a slight, uh, there was a lot of transition that has gone on, but um, the main focus really for this budget was to look to see um, how we can be more effective, but also more efficient in our operations. And I think we were able to accomplish that in a short period of time with the help of amazing staff and the support of the Board of Education. I'll skip through these. So as you can see, um, the mission of the, of the Fairfield Public Schools is to really provide high quality instruction um, academic, professional development and growth for our students and staff. Um, social emotional learning and equity is a priority and paramount in our, our decision making. We have constructed a multi-tiered support system to support students uh, both that need intervention but also enrichment. As I mentioned, I, this budget is grounded in being a fiscally responsible budget. We would like to maintain the excellence as we're all accustomed to here in Fairfield, respect the relationships with our families, our faculty and our community, manage costs, reallocate funds where we uh, feel we can um, achieve savings and reallocate those to our increases, uh, sustain our class size goals and also support strong programming. This budget, what has it accomplished? Well, it's structurally balanced, very strategic. We're maximizing our return on investment and we limited increases across the board. Just a few highlights before we get into the meat and potatoes. I think this is um, something that we sometimes lose sight of, of what are we getting for our money when we invest in our public education system? These are some of the highlights. We have 108 AP scholars. 85% of our AP advanced placement test takers earn a score of three or more. We have three elementary schools in the top 10, per top 10 for ELA performance in the state this past year. One elementary school that ranked number one in the state for growth amongst our high need subgroups. One of our high schools earned the highest math proficiency in the math SAT indicator in our DERG. We have five schools of distinction. We've, we're voted best community for music education in the state of Connecticut. 15 Fairfield Public School art students were named Scholastic Art Award winners. We had six National Merit semifinalists. We have an A plus overall rating and niche. We have FCAC and state champion athletic teams and athletic and student athletes. <coughs> And 86 of our students were selected for SEMA Western Regional uh, Festival. So these are just some of the highlights from this past year. As we move on to the next slide, we have 50 plus honors and advanced placement co course offerings at our high schools. Our 2022 graduates, graduates excuse me, were accepted to over 150 colleges and universities. We have rigorous college prepar preparatory courses. Ward and Ludlow students participate in over 40 varsity athletic teams and 30 sub varsity athletic teams. Over 90% of our, 92% of our students attended post-secondary education. We, ha we afford our students the opportunity for early college experiences through UConn and Sacred Heart University. And our students engage in a variety of art, drama, and music programs. Some of the highlights from on the field and on the court, 43 of our students signed to participate in intercollegiate uh, athletics for this coming year. We have 19 FCAC championships and four, four division championships, 18 state champions, 157 all FCAC recipients and 25 all state recipients. Some of the highlights from our Art Department, 19 Connecticut Regional Scholastic Art Award winners. Our high school artwork were selected at the, for the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth Emerging Young Artists competition. We had a 
Tomlinson art teacher who won the Pally Grant to create mosaic, a, a mosaic mural. Roger Ludlow, middle school teacher and Fairfield art students are highlighted in an article of Time for Kids. And there's a number of community outreach programs that our students and staff participate in throughout the community. And if you've all attended uh, an event um, and, a, and a performance at any of our schools, you know that our music performance uh, takes a back seat to none, our music program. 207 students were selected for the Western Regional Festival and participate in performances with the Boston Children's Chorus, clinic and performance with Canadian Brass, a world-renowned performing ensemble, annual town-wide music festival, uniting musicians from every school across the district to perform in a combined concert, Four sold out performances at our high schools for the holiday concerts, matinee performances of our ho holiday concerts for members of the local senior center and annual performances for the town tree lighting. One in six music faculty are Fairfield Public School alumni, so they come back and they reinvest in our student body. And again, we're the recipient of the best community for music education, top 5% of music education perform, uh, programs in the whole United States of America. So that is the return of our investment. That's the why. That's why we invest in public education here in Fairfield. What does that mean for 23-24? A proposed budget increase of 4.05%, which will make the overall education budget for next school year at $210,695,578. How did we come to this number? Well, there's a number of things, like I said. Some examples of our efficiencies in this budget, our non-resident tuition program, athletic gates, Chromebook insurance fees, and parking fees generate about $350,000 worth of revenue that we reinvest back into the district. There's cost avoidance for in-house programs for elementary students with dyslexia and significant language-based disabilities in our Early Literacy Academy, which brings us an annual savings of approximately $550,000 net. In this budget, we have now come to a more systemic approach to our Chromebook book re, uh, refurbishing and rollout. We're going to do this by certain grade levels so that we get uh, the most bang for our buck and we're more strategic in how we purchase technology across the district. And infrastructure support, engage in software for print and energy management to try to save money utilizing uh, the consortium of pricing for education materials as well. Of this 4.05%, 3.86% of it is contractual obligations, increases to insurance benefits. And if you're not aware, we um, had a extreme need um, in underpaying our paraeducators. And in this budget, we have now finally come to an agreement with our paraeducators to probably to finally make their salary more competitive so that we can fill our vacancies and we can retain these much needed um, members of our staff. Full-time contracts. Um, causes an increase of almost $3 million, as you can see, 1.4% of the increase. We have mandated staffing, our English language learners, that we have to increase the service per the state mandate, which is about 0.22%, uh, uh, close to 550,000. We have some increase in student supports to meet the mental health needs of our students who are struggling post-COVID, 336,215, which is almost 0.2%, and then again, the paraeducator um, compensation agreement is uh, almost 1% of the increase at $1.8 million. And then, of course, the um, we're, we're trying to be conservative. We budgeted with the projections from the state partnership, Connecticut State Partnership Plan, of about a 10% increase, which will raise the insurance benefits by, as you can see, uh, almost $2.4 million, or 1.18% of an increase. So outside of that, the increase to our budget is very minimal, as you can see. 
again, fiscally responsible and efficient while maximizing um, the programming for our students and the support for our staff. Oh, here we go, okay. We did um, have some increases in uh, transportation for next year, as you can all imagine, with gas prices on the rise. Uh, utilities and facilities, we see a slight increase, but through some of our um, green energy initiatives, we are seeing uh, some payback into, into our budget. And IT and maintenance, just a slight increase, as you can imagine, with cost, supply chain issues, and things that everyone across the nation is currently facing. We did see some reductions in instruction, services, and fees uh, over last year at about $792,000. We did save about $100,000 on some of our contracted uh, services. Capital equipment is seeing almost a quarter of a million dollar reduction and purchase services almost $50,000. So all totaled, we did see a reduction in found savings of over a million dollars in the current budget for next year. While we do and will see an increase in some areas, our out of town, uh, out of district tuition, um, those prices and costs continue to rise. Uh, some of the enhancements to our staff, we have to increase by one class, uh, the Early Literacy Academy at McKinley School. Uh, but as you can, as you heard previously, that investment uh, is right now uh, re giving us a return of about $550,000 in cost avoidance um, net. We are increasing some athletic coaches at our high schools to improve upon some of the programs that our kids are currently asking to compete. Um, at an um, interscholastic level, our music department chairs um, and our discipline chairs are going to be getting uh, a little bit of um, reduction in class load so that they can manage the departments that they service. Um, and then supply books and materials, we're trying to invest a little bit this year. And, um, also phase in for some state mandated right to read legislation which was passed last uh, legislative session. Oh, here we go. These are some of the budget lines that we have seen a reduction. Tech capital outlay, we reduced the budget by a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, tech systems and equipment maintenance, we found savings about $16,000. District technology and supplies, uh, we found a little over $50,000 in savings. Other supplies and materials, almost $44,000. We're saving $27,000 again in our copy services. Our professional consultations for special education, our special ed department has done a great job in reducing the cost there, over $200,000. We're saving through nursing services almost $400,000. Our speech services that were currently being provided, we found a reduction there in a little over $262,000. Um, we found some effective efficiencies in the math assessment area, math improvement, and overall instructional staff development. So those are the areas where we found reductions, where we can reinvest in some of the things that we think are more of a priority moving forward. There has been some questions regarding some of the reduction in our enrollment across the district over time. Uh, I know a question will come up, well, we've seen some reduction in our overall enrollment. Why aren't we seeing a reduction in our budget? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite correlate with the two. Um, these are spread across 17 schools and 13 grade levels, so unless there's a high concentration of enrollment decline in one school, one grade level, you're not going to see any savings in the budget. So I just wanted to make that mention now and get it out of the way because I'm sure that's going to be a question that would be asked. However, just like across the state and across the nation, Fairfield is also experiencing with a slight decline in enrollment and increase in the number of students with special needs who require special services. As you can see, this is a slide that we put together since 2017. You can see that with the slight decline in enrollment, we're seeing a, a, also an uptick in the number of students that receive special education services. Um, but again, through solid programming, innovative 
um, ideas and efficiencies, our special education department has been able to minimize the increase to the budget this year and into next year. And just to show similar trend across the state, as you can see here, the blue line trending down is the state uh, overall student enrollment. It's down about 12%. However, students um, that are uh, identified with individuals' education plans has increased by 26%. So, although we're seeing less students across the state of Connecticut and here in Fairfield, our children are struggling and require special um, services to be able to meet their needs so they can grow academically and social emotionally. We also want to stay competitive within not only Southern Fairfield County, but within um, and, and surrounding towns. As you can see, um, we're a little bit slightly below the state average in per pupil expenditure. Um, we are right in the midst as we try to compete with our neighboring towns for not only for um, staff, um, but also for resources. But I think um, we, we're doing a pretty good job with what we currently have, but it's also something to be mindful as we move forward that we will need to stay competitive, uh, especially in a very competitive job market. Some of the pressures and mandates that are putting a strain on our budget, again, 3.3% staff and benefits, contractual obligations, state mandated right to read legislation, and also addressing the needs of our English language learners. The 1.19% paraeducator compensation, we have our early, re, uh, early literacy academy reinvestment, and also um, much needed student mental health supports and expanded athletic programs to allow more kids to participate and thrive uh, through our athletic programs. But again, we did have some critical investments in cost management with a 0.44% reduction in special education adjustments, technology replacement, and copier contracts. This is just a brief summary of the overall increases um, to the budget, which get us to the 4.05%. And as we think about 23, 24, we also need to think beyond that. And some of the things that I think we need to be aware of, uh, again, very competitive job market. Um, we do have teacher contract negotiations that we will be entering into during the 23, 24 school year. Um, just to be mindful that Fairfield does not rank amongst the highest in compensating its staff, its teaching staff. So, and um, if we're, going to be able to recruit and retain top talent, we need to be mindful of that moving forward as we decide to um, and settle contracts with our teachers next year. So that is something that we were very cognizant of is in this budget, knowing that this could have impact long term in future budgets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, first of all, that was probably the most succinct uh, budget presentation we've gotten in three years and pretty on education and it's beautiful. Oh, and thank you. Whoever did it, it's going to do mine next year. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to bring them over here. I like it so much. But um, all kidding aside, um, really bravo uh, to you, uh, Mr. Tostani, because this is the most fiscally responsible budget I have seen since I came into this office. Um, you and I had a lot of conversations, and uh, I just think that the f fresh look at how we do things has made a significant difference, and without compromising the quality of the education, and bravo to the Board of Education uh, for choosing, first of all, Mr. Tostani, and um, for <laughs> your work on this budget. Um, I Honestly, I think it's it, it hits all the areas that you need, uh, that we need. You're emphasizing areas that are important. The savings, obviously, are very um, welcomed. And um, just even your look at the, uh, the Chromebooks. I mean, I was just amazed that you're just a simple review of how they're utilized would produce such an, an enormous amount of savings where we could be using money in more, you know, areas that I think um, have a higher value for educational excellence. And it was nice to see all the awards that we're receiving. I mean, I love seeing that. Um, 
I love seeing how well our students are doing and the opportunities that they have. Um, thank you. Thank you, and, and we're hopeful that some of the investments that we're making this year um, will also heed and, and trickle down into future budgets and to some savings um, and other areas where we can reinvest in more critical areas like student mental health. Yeah, and, and, I, and I did know um, during my budget presentation on Wednesday, um, the ad of the social worker uh, that, that was added, I think that is crucial and important and very cognizant of where we are uh, as far as with our students. And I want to give a round of applause to Courtney for uh, securing $350,000 <laughs> FEMA grant. Bravo to you. Uh, that was great to hear. Uh, and I'm going to open it up to the board for questions. Do you want to take down the slide um, so that we could see our... Uh, yeah, we'll let the gentleman there. Our board? Not good. You don't want to do it, Mr. No, I, I can't see anything. <laughs> you might want to invest in a pair of glasses. I got them. <laughs> yesterday, I got, went to the, yeah, just Did yesterday. You? Yeah, I went oh, to the Oh, okay. Well, good for you. All right. <laughs> yes, Nancy, go right ahead. Um, hello, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I will also echo, I, I mean, it's, it's impressive in terms of, tight budget that the Board of Ed and that you've presented. Um, I have a couple questions and I'll, questions will probably prompt more questions. Um, was this the budget that was submitted? Was it voted on unanimously? Some of this I know and some of it I'm just asking for the record. I just wanted to understand um, that. I believe it was eight to one. Um, and it wasn't a, um, <laughs> the one was not anything attributed to the budget and the ask. I think there was just um, uh, an issue that with one, one area, so. Are you, are you willing or able to speak on that? And I know it's all public record, I just. Yep, anybody could watch the meeting. Um, it was made very clear that there was one uh, small item on the budget um, that was a little uh, contentious for some members. Um, and the uh, member that voted against the budget um, took a couple minutes to stress stress how supportive she was of the overall budget and everything else that you and Mrs. Kupchak just, just mentioned. So uh, while the vote was an 8-1, um, because of a specific part of the budget, um, it, the sense of the body was an overall, overall overwhelming support. And I don't want to start with something negative, so I'm just, I'm just trying to understand holistically, and can you tell, tell us what that issue was? Um, yeah, there's, this has been a discussion that has gone on um, for a couple years now, and it's related to um, elementary accelerated math in the um, fourth and fifth grade. Um, and the board has been, uh, board and administration have been working um, on a solution uh, for that. No, it was the textbooks. That was the no, no, it was yeah. math. It, but it 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 all it all relates to to an academic yeah so it was there was um, I believe it was thirty two thousand dollars in there um, for uh, elementary um, to work towards solving the issue of um, the removal of the math academy okay, but a sense of the body I will echo that for also for the record that the overwhelming sense of the body was supportive of this budget um, you had mentioned the grant um, and. The first black woman had talked about this, and I just would like some clarification around it, and maybe you don't know this yet. My understanding of the grant was that it was COVID reimbursement and not necessarily an offset, because the first black woman had mentioned that it could be used to offset um, the proposed cut in the proposed first black woman's budget. Do you know of, in terms of how that is? Again, my understanding was that it was a COVID reimbursement thing, and it had to be applied in certain ways, and it might not necessarily be able to be applied. Yeah. To this year's budget. Yeah. So, so I did also just want to thank the town because thank you, Mrs. Kupchuk, for thanking me. But the town also worked with us to secure that funding, um, and it is a reimbursement, um, and it will be cash coming in um, once all the uh, paperwork is satisfied and completed. But it's basically to offset money spent, is my understanding of like COVID emergency. Is that right? Um, or, or it's to reimburse for money that was spent in previous years. And and the only reason I bring this up is more. And again, I appreciate that it's tighter and that in terms of a cut, it's five hundred thousand. So I, I just want to sort of also highlight the reality that with all the expenses of salary, which is a huge driver of this budget, it's not a lot of 
extra. You know, when you have maintenance and you have um, all the other things that go into it that are have tos, it gives very, very tiny room for some of the not even nice to have. I mean, it's sort of more than that. And I just want to encourage us to be looking, as I know you are, and the Board of Ed is, is thoughtful and, and this is all um, forward thinking that to remain competitive, to remain at the highest level. I just don't want us to be like cutting ourselves short either, you know, just to come into some number. And, and it's not necessarily for this year. I just don't want the trend to be that you're so concerned about, that the body is so concerned about fitting a number and a percentage increase that we forget that it's not a lot of extra room once you're. No, I think just getting a, a just an overall fresh set of eyes, mm -hmm. as was, was mentioned, I think is healthy. Um, we do have a lot that we offer our students, and I think that's most important. Um, we would not sacrifice anything that would be something that our students uh, would need or should have uh, just for a, a percentage. Um, that's not how I operate, but I do think that we need to be very careful um, as we decide to add things that we know our students need. We have to make, it, make sure that we reassess periodically to make sure that that reinvestment is giving us the return that we expect. Um, I'm not sure how much of that was done in the past. I can't speak to that, but I know moving forward, we are looking at, as a collective group, um, we have a team of folks that are looking at what we've spent money on, um, if it's programs, what the usage is on those programs, and what impact they're having um, in the classroom on our students' academic and social-emotional growth. Um, we do have some reinvestments into some things that I think down the road will reap um, some big rewards, just listening to our staff, to our families over the last four months, um, some different programs that I think that will help um, better communicate, give us more data at our fingertips to make better decisions. And, and just to say from the from the board aspect, um, you know, not speaking for the entire board, but just the process, I think the board um, would agree that this is not a sparse budget. Um, there are some meaty things in here and some changes that will hopefully bring about some effectiveness and change and betterment for the education of the children. Um, and some of that was funded, as Mr. Testani said in the presentation, from offsets. So finding areas that we don't need to spend the money doesn't necessarily mean that we're cutting ourselves short, but we're actually being smart and reinvesting that money. So um, the board board agrees with your sentiment, though. Yeah. Um, can I, I have a couple no. more? Okay. Um, and it's great to always hear those things, you know, the enhancements. And, and um, this is a beautiful, I like the color. <laughs> and it's clear. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those where you, like the early literacy um, program is an efficiency, but what else were you then able to kind of juice up a little bit? Great to hear. Well, we are investing in what we call a data warehouse that will be able to produce data. That was one of the things that was explicitly communicated to me from our building principals and staff that they don't have um, data in real time that can help them in dis uh, driving and making decisions when it comes to programming. Um, we are also investing in a um, new communication method with our parents that will improve and also establish two-way communication between families and staff. Um, this way then we're not just sending out information, um, we're able to also garner um, information and questions from our family so we can be more responsive. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. We're going to kick off a pilot with some schools in the next month or so. Um, that was approved by the town um, just the other day. So we're, we're hopeful to get that off the ground. I've run that by our PTA council. They're very excited to see a more efficient and 20, 21st century method of communication with our families. Uh, we're also looking to improve um, instruction in the classroom through professional development that's already begun with our administrators, our coaches. Um, and we're also looking to improve instruction by looking at it through a more, um, I don't want to say a, an accountability me uh, measure, but um, beefing up the administrative support within our elementary schools to make sure that um, our programs and our, our instruction is being delivered at high quality. Our teachers are being supported um, 
positive feedback is, is constant, and um, we're ensuring that we're able to, for example, yesterday I met with a group of new teachers to make sure that we are doing our due diligence and providing them with support so that they stay here in Fairfield. They, you know, keep their roots here in Fairfield and they're able to service our kids. We want the best of the best here. Um, just a few more comments. Um, we met first at the uh, Islamic Community Center where a lot of students were advocating for the addition of Eid to the school calendar and I think that was such an incredible thing for our school system. And the um, articulate nature of some of those students who spoke from our high schools was just extraordinary and really heartwarming and I hope makes the whole community feel great about the students that are going through the school system. I'm also judging the PTA has a competition every year in film and so sort of wearing my day job hat, I've been able to look at some of the projects coming out of that uh, cohort and they're amazing and the things that are on the hearts and minds of these kids is really extraordinary. Um, one thing you mentioned which I love to hear um, but but uh, I'm not. I'd be curious how it's going to play out. You're committed to the multicultural multicultural education of our students and equity, and it's wonderful to hear you say that out loud. I'm concerned that that position, and not looking at the specific person, um, but as Mr. Flynn had said yesterday, it's important to look at the position. Um, and I'm just concerned with that cut. That that job. That person didn't. That job wasn't given really a lot of time to kind of go through a couple cycles and figure out what the community uh, is about and how it needs to function. And so I'm just concerned that that position is not being accounted for. So I mean, well, to tackle issues of equity. So we do have some partnerships that we're establishing with some folks that I have good relationships with that I think will come in. Um, help not only facilitate the work in the um, at the point we're currently at, but also build capacity within our staff so that this work will live on um, and doesn't live with just one person or one position, but that this is something that's a sediment that rings out throughout the entire Fairfield Public School community and beyond. So um, working with some colleagues, but also with some partners that I've worked with in the past um, that I think will, in the short and long term, meet the needs of Fairfield. Um, there are some amazing student groups that I hope you also reach out to as part of that exploration and partnership um, because they will hold you to account, I'm sure. So uh, this is a, a great group of kids as well. And I'm happy to turn it over for, for now, but I just yes. want to look through. And but Thank you. Thank You're you. Um, and, and obviously, I think that Mr. Tastani has a lot of good connections from his time in Bridgeport, um, one of the diverse, most diverse probably school systems and in the whole state. So. Uh, I'm going to open it up, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tani, first of all, publicly uh, welcome. Uh, you and I did have the opportunity to uh, have a couple of conversations privately, so I appreciate that, and I wish you the best of luck in your tenure because it's to all of our advantages for you to succeed. Thank you. I appreciate that. I like your commentary on, on moving forward, and I want to um, talk about that a little bit. You, you've been in the job. Uh, for a few months now, uh, coming in with an outside perspective. Um, you were kind enough to talk me through the whole issue we have with the teachers and being competitive in salaries. Um, that's going to be an upward pressure on your budget over the next number of years. Um, can you talk a little bit about areas of savings? And I know you don't want to go into specifics, but what are you kind of looking at in the future here? Um, or, or what is come to your mind as you come in from the outside areas where we might find savings and not impact programs? Uh, that's a good question. I think really just looking at the overall um, academic achievement and looking at numbers, um, you know, being a former high school administrator and scheduler, just making sure that we're running the best schedule at our high schools where kids are getting the most opportunities but we're not, um, we're not being wasteful in offering classes um, at different times that we can consolidate and possibly, um, instead of having five in a classroom, we could have 12, for example. I, I mean, I'm just using this very uh, generically, but I think it's important to make sure that we're operating um, effectively, but also efficiently. And I think without losing opportunities for children to access 
whether it's advanced courses, elective courses, but also and 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 intervention um, areas, but making sure that we're not being wasteful and just, for example, I've seen, um, and you know, many years ago I had, did an audit of, um, of, a, of a schedule at a school that I worked at when I first got there, and we were able to um, cut teachers, but also inc improve and increase offerings to, for students. And it doesn't sound like it's possible, but it is if you look at things very closely and carefully, and you listen to students, a lot of times students are being placed in classes they may not particularly like it wasn't their first or second choice but it's the only option because uh, we're not operating the schedule as as we effectively as we can so those are some areas also looking to see at some of our investment this year um, in increasing our oversight at the elementary level what that could look like and um, how we can be better in supporting our teachers across the district again retention and recruitment is, is key it's not just here in Fairfield it's across the nation um, you have about 70 percent of teachers leaving the profession in the first uh, five years which is is a troubling number so it's really trying to get a handle on how we can best support teachers going forward it's not just um, simply economic Economics that goes way way beyond economics. Yeah, it's um, you know one of the things that I've been cognizant of and brought up a, a number of times has been you know as our enrollment has gone down over the past number of years and then stabilized actually it, it stopped kind of going down as much our our number of staff have continued to tick up and while that's understandable given some of the must, uh, the mandates and the things of the like, it's also an unsustain unsustainable business model, particularly as if, if, as you point out, if we're not competitive in our salaries. And it's, you know, it's a, whether we like it or not, it's a service industry. And as my colleagues pointed out earlier, such a large percentage of your expense relates to staff. This is probably some tough decisions that are going to be need to be made there to your point relative to classes offered relative to uh, what needs to be maintained and what needs to be addressed as we move forward. And I just don't want to lose sight of that because that's kind of the structural change that we've spoken about a lot, but I haven't seen a lot of being fundamentally addressed. Uh, understood. I, I also think it's also imperative as we enter into those conversations with the collective bargaining units that there is a a balance that they need to understand as well because we can give huge salary increases and then at the expense of uh, of jobs down the road so i think that's something that we've already had some preliminary conversations um just really off 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 the record to make sure that we can stay competitive uh but without the detriment to maintaining uh, our staff. Yeah, and I, and I would encourage you to be creative, you know, with the two high schools. Is there ways we can deliver similar coursework across both high schools with, with less resources and using technology and the like? Um, just whatever we can do, because I am concerned with the continued growth. Uh, look, you've got a huge obligation. You've had, you know, as, as demonstrated early in the presentation, good success with outcomes. And I'm just concerned about the, the town's continued ability to afford it at that level. And, and that's where I've always talked about. Um, some specific questions. A number of years ago, we went into the state medical plan on the teacher side. It, it was a huge boon for us at the time in uh, savings from the annual increases that we had. Um, in recent years, as the states, and, and you probably dealt with this in Bridgeport somewhat, as the states kind of look to um, hit Fairfield County a bit harder for these medical increases given our location and our medical costs, have, has there been consideration given to reevaluating that in medical insurance? Yes, we, moving forward? we've had that conversation and we are looking to possibly go out to RFP to see if we can test the market and, and achieve savings because um, that was the the initial savings that when all municipalities were allowed to jump in and, and join the Connecticut partnership plan was it was great initially but the increases have uh, 
been much higher over the last several years than originally was promised. So there are some t talks also at the state level at offering some different planning um, that we would have choices of, but again, that's part of, we would have to negotiate that with the unions. Um, those contracts, you know, have a certain level of service that we need and care that we need to provide their members. Yeah, and one. Yeah, and uh, I'm sorry. Just I think that would be look for a change there if if there is a potential. Like, what's the the timing of that issue. RFP process, and what year are we looking at? So we did just issue the RFP. We expect to get results in uh, April. I think it was issued a week or two ago. Um, so, but I, I just did want to point out that over the last six years since we've been in the plan, there was a point where it was um, costing us more than it would if we were self-insured, and last year. Yeah, when you average out last year because we right-sized a little after, you know, the pandemic and things that weren't as predictable, um, we did see a savings if you average it out over six years. It's just that, to your point, we don't know what will happen in the future. So to remain competitive, Mr. Tistani did ask us to go out to bid to look at the market. <clears throat> yeah, and I, and I do think that a lot of those savings, if I remember correctly, were in the very early years. We had nice, large savings. And then in, as the state has messed with its formula a bit, I think those savings have shrunk a little bit, Correct. if I recall correctly. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another comment. Have you – what type of benchmarking have you done against it? You know, I saw the it, – it's always the, the slide I like least when they bring up and say, hey, we're not spending enough per pupil as to the average, because I always say congratulations with all your awards and stuff. That means you're being efficient. Um, but what else have you done for benchmarking across other communities? What have you looked at? So we did see your analysis. Um, we continued forward with the analysis of going back a decade and looking at where we were and uh, taking into account the Angelic factor relative to, uh, to other districts. And, you know, we are still competitive. So even though the price per pupil right now is 99% of the average for the Fairfield County, we're still competitive relative to where we were years ago in terms of if you factor in the Angelic factor and then if you also factor in the size of our district, because we have a little bit more economy of scale to absorb some of those declines in student population. So I would I, I would say that, you know, as the presentation shows, we are competitive. I would uh, say that we want to remain competitive um, in a market that we're going to see increased costs for educators, as Mr. Sassani mentioned. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I, miss a, I, I might not have explained my question. With all the awards and, and everything else that we have and, and kind of the great success with kids going to college and all that, how do we stack up against our, for lack of a better word, competition, right? We we talk about how we stack up in cost per pupil. How do we, how does our achievements stack up as compared to our other districts that we would um, compare ourselves to, right? Because we're, we're comparing the cost, but I don't see us comparing the achievements. You, you put up a great list of achievements and on their own, they look very impressive. But how do I, how do I benchmark that and understand how that compares to our, as I said, quote unquote, competition, right? For lack of a better word. Well, I think we're very competitive when you look at not only just our competition, which, you know, they use the, the DERG, um, not so much as they used to, but, um, but also, um, you know, looking at Southern Fairfield County. So uh, it's hard to make that comparison to towns like Darien and New Canaan. Uh, but then again, it's also um, difficult to, to compare us to Bridgeport. So uh, Fairfield is a unique community. It's a, uh, a growing community, as uh, recently published in a Connecticut Post article last week. Um, people are coming to Fairfield. I think it's it's fair to say um, it's because of the, the quality of schools, but also the programs that that we offer it within the schools not just the academic programs but the music the art the athletics um, the town programs I you know give credit to Anthony and the town programs are, are exceptional here so I think it's, it's it's really a testament to to the overall Fairfield community right yeah so do we have those stats or no I mean, they're public information. We can go on the state uh, State Department of Ed uh, website and do comparisons, but I don't. I don't think you'll get an apples to apples comparison. That's that's the issue. Um, 
but I think when you look at subgroups, I think we are exceeding um, in, in many areas, and in there's some areas that we can be, uh, we're, we're looking at to improve upon. Yeah, we're not apples to apples, as, as was pointed out earlier, with the cost per pupil either. So I just, I, again, I just look at that and say, if we're going to do the benchmarking, we've got to do it both ways. Um, one other thing I, I have a question on, only because people have approached me recently. Was there something that happened with a math curriculum recently where we went out and bought a ton of textbooks and tried to implement a math program, and then we've pulled back on that? At the at the present time, and I know, and please, I'm not asking for a game of God as a game of gotcha. I'm asking because people have asked me, and I don't know the answer to that. And um, what I'd like to know is, yes, if that happened, and then the next thing, and Mr. Tosani, you're new. What are we doing to try to stop that from happening again? If in fact that's that did happen. So we did invest in a uh, a digital program. It's not they're, they're not textbooks, so we don't have a bunch of textbooks just sitting around uh, collecting dust. It is a digital program that we are. Currently, as we revise the curriculum across uh, the three math courses, it will be embedded and implemented um, over the next, it's a six year um, subscription, so it'll be embedded over the next five. So there, there isn't um, a lot of waste as people may uh, assume and, and there's no books. Um, actually, that's one of the issues that um, some of the folks had, that there was no consumables with that. So that will be an investment that we're considering some consumables that will go along with the digital program. Yeah. We do in that, have you had to make any adjustments to how we go about acquiring um, these types of curriculums and, and, and stuff? Is, is that brought up anything or is that, do you think we're being efficient in that? Uh, okay. I'm not trying to micromanage, I'm trying to... No, nope. I think it has caused us to look within. We are currently looking at resources for our elementary literacy program, and as a result of um, some issues that we did, little bumps in the road, we have a more extensive um, process and procedure in not only viewing programs, also visiting school districts that are implementing these programs, talking to educators. Uh, and looking at data. So it, it has caused us to uh, be more deliberate in how we um, effectively choose programs moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that and thank you. And, and my last question, I know that you guys are um, very early on in, in a process of looking at, at redistricting or like, which God love you, I know that causes a lot of angst across the town and all that. But what's the, what's the time frame of that, just so that I can put it into perspective as we sit here? Sorry. Um, Tom, it's Nick Asa here. Um, just to speak to the uh, redistricting, uh, the redistricting timeline. So in January, the board voted on the charge for SLAM, um, formerly Malone and McBroom. Uh, so they, they have it with them now, and it will take approximately several months uh, to come up with the scenarios that they will then present to the board. We are planning to have the scenarios presented to the board in May. We will then continue and send them more questions, and we will look at uh, community forums and public feedback. Uh, we will then um, decide as a board if there is one or two scenarios that we want to explore further, um, and that process will continue, ultimately culminating per our state-approved racial balance amendment uh, with a vote at the end of October for um, the school year after that, uh, so the 24-25 school year. So it wouldn't go into effect next year, um, but the vote would happen in October and it would be for 24-25. So it would just be able to slip in under the wire for the next the next fiscal year's budget, which was trying to, what I was trying to get to in the like, right? Yeah, and, and part of our timeline is, is cognizant of that. So there will, there will potentially obviously be many talks with uh, around budgetary implications. Yeah, that's, I wanted to confirm that. Thanks, Nick. That's kind of what I understood, but I wanted to make sure I had that right. No, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the presentation and all the work, and, and again, um, to the school board and that, congratulations on the past success, and, uh, you know, to Mr. Stastani, uh I wish you the best of luck uh, as you move forward, and, and I look forward to, to seeing what you can do uh, with our school system.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, I'd like to go back to a couple things. Um, back to the um, conversation on the grant and the and the three hundred thousand um, dollars. Given that it's not going to be able to be applied, what's going to happen? Because I'm, when I look at like past years, and, and again, I don't want to undermine the incredible work of Fresh Eyes. And when I look at past years' percentage increase, um, five hundred thousand dollars. I know it's not, you know tremendous in terms of the overall thing. But I, w I feel like the flip side of that is that's a $500,000 is a big nugget to make up. And given that the increased request is only, what, 4.05, and given that it's less than the past couple of years and sort of competitive with where it's been years before that, what's going to happen to that 500000 Like, where is that coming from since it is so tight and it is so thoughtful? I just wonder if cutting it at all. Well, whatever the number is that's decided upon, we'll then take a look and sit down and see. But I think a lot of the um, increases of years past, from my understanding, were because of the special education costs. And from my understanding, last year there was uh, an investment into special education that we seem to have... Um, oh, yeah. We seem to have gotten a handle on the expenditures in that area. And again, Mr. Mancuso and his his team, um, Mancusi, excuse me, and his team, um, they've been able to achieve some savings through some contracted services. We're looking at um, some some other areas where we feel that we can be more effective in servicing our kids. Sure. I forgot. Um, so Carol Guernsey, I'm the Secretary of the Board of Education, and thank you for that question. Um, obviously, I'm here to support the budget that uh, we submitted to you, and um, it's such a good question because we don't have an answer of where will um, you know where will that hit us. You know, five hundred thousand dollars is is a big chunk, and um, you know. It's not something our board has discussed, and I can't say that it won't hurt our students. Um, so obviously, we would try to find an area, you know, as Mr. Tistani um, recognized. I, you know, that's not something that we'd be able to promise. And then, um, so I would just jump in and say, um, you know, I appreciate that. Um, obviously, the superintendent is really the one who manages the budget um, and, and controls the school system, and um, in a in a budget as large as the school districts is, um, while well, 500,000 sounds like a lot to all of us because it's you know a lot of money to all of us, it's a very small percentage in this in the size of that budget. And um, yeah, can I and, can I ask what the exact percentage is, Brenda? Yeah, um, Jared, what is it? About half a percent. About a half a percent. Approximately. Do you want to know the exact? What is the percentage to, of the 500? Less yeah. than. Uh, out of the entire education budget, point five hundred okay. two million is uh, Frank, our our numbers guy. Five point two five percent. I'm sorry. One point oh nine is two million. So if you don't mind, if I jump in while we're calculating that. Um, the other thing I would say is, I mean, we don't have a contingency fund for the Board of Education budget. So um, as we go through this process, we have other variables that are at risk and at play here, too, that um, are under consideration. Um, you know, different insurance increases. In, a, in addition, you know, we were talking about math earlier. We haven't addressed um, what we're going to do with those students. There could be additional costs there. So um, 500000 maybe more than. 500,000. And then if I could follow up. So I just want to, um, Jared said it's 0.24. So it's a quarter of a percent of the entire budget, um, which is obviously yeah. minute. Um, so I would just say that, um, you know, my first budget, obviously, we were all had our hair on fire because the pandemic had just hit, and um, we were all terrified that the world was ending. So we were we we wanted to make sure we had a zero percent, and we were cutting everything you know known to man. Um, and then we had to come back and fill those gaps. We didn't fund certain important um, town funds and things of that nature, and and we got by and we made it work. Um, and and again, even even in the year where. Um, 
I, I cut the education budget pretty severely because I thought it was an extraordinarily high increase. And I didn't just think that. A lot of people thought that. Um, the, the Board of Ed still ended up with a surplus. So, so I'm not saying um, that you know there isn't some pencil and, and eraser work that needs to get done. I have to do that with my own budget all the time. We have fluctuations as well in health insurance accounts. And I mean, it's fluctuating every day. Um, and so we have to make changes, and and we work. And and again, I like the board of selectmen. You know, they they vote on budgets, and they're part of it. But the actual administration is the one that does this work every day. You know, sits down and has these meetings and says, okay, this changed, and that changed, and this changed, and and makes cha decisions every day to um, to manage it. And I. I I personally, I would, first of all, I would never um, do anything to hurt our students. I served six years on the Board of Ed. I have a strong, long-time um, commitment to education issues. And so I believe that the $500,000 is not going to impact us, any student um, in, in a negative way. So just to respond to that, like yeah. May I ask a question? Sure, Tom, go ahead. Uh, it's actually two questions. Number one, what was the surplus that the Board of Ed ran last year, and what is the current surplus that the Board of Ed is running this year? Last, last, thank you. Last, this is Courtney Laboria, CFO uh, for Fairfield Public Schools. Last year's surplus was about 150000 at year end that we did give back to the town. Prior to that, there were some transfers that happened because we did have surpluses in given areas. This year, our latest Q2 projection that we just presented to the Board of Finance on Tuesday showed a two, roughly $200,000 surplus, but after a series of transfers, again, um, due to surpluses that we have in individual line item major category areas, which includes personnel um, and associated benefits as well as busing. Our budget that we put forward today considers um, an adjustment to the assumptions that underlie how we can staff, which is a very um, hopeful for return to a good future, but also realistic. So in terms of the bus drivers, it's something you'll see a slight, even though there's a slight increase in the bus number, it actually represents you know a decrease in the number of buses because it's funding the fuel, et cetera. So, uh, to answer your question, I apologize. About, the transfers. Uh, the transfers so far to date that the board authorized was uh, not over two million dollars. Uh, not last year. This year it's about one point two million so far. I don't recall the transfer from last year. I thought last year. I thought this year was trending closer. Yeah, one point two. Million, yeah. I thought last year was a similar number. This year is trending to be. We project about two million in total transfers amongst categories. Yes. Um, and which is what you did was you had uh, you had surpluses in certain categories and you're moving them to other categories and spending the funds uh, correct yes so in this year's budget mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in this proposed budget, uh, Mr. Testani did have us go uh, do like a zero-based budget and look at e every piece of the budget and build up so that, you know, you question each each aspect of the budget. And so we would say that we've put forward a responsible budget considering the experience of the last two years. But yes, we did. I have no, I have, yeah. I have no <laughs> doubt that it's a responsible budget. Yeah. Tom, can, Tom, can I just, can I scoot in here really quick? For He's right. Years yeah. And... <laughs> There's no way you budget to the point where you can't absorb a 0.2% a change in your budget. To, to answer your question, on, on January 26th, the board voted to transfer $1.293 million um, to, right. from, so that was the number that you asked for. Right. And I would just say that um, the superintendent and I have had um, discussions about, you know, partnering on some issues um, that the town can assist with certain things. Um, obviously, we, we, and, and I, in my PowerPoint presentation on Wednesday, and I, I've done this every year, um, and this is your first year, so um, I'm sure you weren't glued to watching it. <laughs> but we have a lot of shared services, obviously, um, and I believe uh, in the PowerPoint presentation, you know, the, I think it's, what was it, um, Jared, 60? 66% is at the education of the town side. And then what was the shared services um, percentage, Frank? That's included in the 
Okay. So we share, obviously, a lot of services. Uh, the town picks up the nurses, the school nurses, and we assist with um, a lot of other things. So I know there's ways, and we have talked about working together, um, so that obviously none of the children are impacted by the uh, 0.24 or less than a quarter percent um, uh, change. So to respond to that, because I was cut off by Mr. Flynn earlier to your comment about never um, hurting students, not to belabor this, but we can't guarantee that. The budget includes that additional $500,000, so when we cut that, we don't know where that's going to come from. And um, as a board member, I feel responsible to protect that and to protect the students in our district. Thank you. Sure, go ahead, Nancy. Okay, so just to be clear, so it's the number, the 66% includes the shared, Jared, right? From based on the... Yeah. There, so the board events portion of the share. Right, so without the shared expenses, I'm just... Their, is their under portion. 60%. Our portion is, what is our portion? Uh, so, just, oh, can I provide a clarification? Uh, We're using the term shared, but um, I, I think more accurately they would be services provided by the town for the for the Board of Education. So it's not like, yeah. you know, it's services that we provide for them. And then um, I'd like to go back to, and Mr. Mancusi, this is probably more for you. Um, <laughs> The structural change, it's, it's always sort of a catchphrase that gets me a little bit uncomfortable because this chart, I'm referring to the chart here, I don't know what the page is, because it's really, again, we talk about not apples to apples, and it really isn't fair, and so I'd love to hear more about this. I don't think um, to be able to say, well, enrollment and this, the needs of the students are changing. We're identifying more kids, and so if you could talk about that, because I, I think it's almost not a, it's not a fair it's almost not fair to put it together in my assessment to give people a real picture because when I was saying salaries are a large driver, I wasn't saying that as an indictment. I was saying that as a celebration and a support because of that number, because of the needs, social, emotional, special ed. So if you could talk about that. The, the best chart, um, Rob Mancusi, Executive Director, Special Ed. This chart shows that over time, you know, you know, Mr. Mr. Tesnani said the overall enrollment of our student body has has declined a little bit, but um, the increase in special education students' needs, as well as identification of the number of students who need special education services, not only in Fairfield but across the state, continue to increase. Um, we have students with significant needs, um, and what this is showing is, you know, and, and we're gr very grateful for our Board of Education for investing in our special education staff and programming so we can deliver services um, in district, keep kids in district, and not have to place them out of district. We live or work in an area where there is a lot of competition, a lot of private schools that we compete with, so um, the investment that we're making and that we've made over the past multiple years in the Fairfield Public Schools to improve the quality of our in-district programming is, in essence, it, it's a massive cost avoidance if we did not have these programs. So can you talk about that? Because the cost, my understanding is the cost of outplacement, really when you do that math, is there a simple sort of math equation you can talk about or calculus that you can talk about to explain that? Well, when we look at the cost avoidance of our in-district programming um, compared to our out-of-district programming, tuition costs, depending on the nature of a student's disability, our outplacement costs, you know, at a minimum for a, a, just a day program um, is about $70,000. For kids with more significant um, needs, it could be in excess of one hundred dollars to $200,000. And those are just for day programs. And then I, it's, it's kind of a more of a comment because Mr. Testani, I love the approach of like the bottom up and re-looking at everything. And given that you've done that, I would really encourage us as a board to um, look at at this budget holistically in terms of what the Board of Ed has provided and really accept that knowing that you have done that kind of interrogation and um, evaluation. And um, while it's your first rodeo here in Fairfield, it's not your first rodeo. So um, I would just encourage this body to take that to heart as well, knowing that our Board of Ed also, for the most part, was unanimous, at least in spirit, um, of the budget presented. So. Thank you for that approach. I think it was probably overdue, but with fresh eyes. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Madam Tom. Ursula, woman. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. 
first of all, to whoever thought that I cut them off, my apologies. Technology is great. Until it doesn't work, and then it's hard to know when somebody else is speaking. So I in, in no way meant to cut anybody off. Um, that said, um, to what Nancy just said in terms of it not being fair, uh, I agree. It's not fair, um, but it's reality. And as we're called upon to uh, fund additional needs for the students um, due to what's going on in the world, whether it's the pandemic or whatever, um, we do have to look at some of the things that maybe historically we've done and understand better whether we need to con continue to do those or whether we can afford to do those. And I think that's what Mr. T Testani, not to put words in his mouth, has indicated he's doing, looking at the way we're delivering programs and what programs we're delivering and what electives we're delivering and whether we can continue to afford to do that while being forced to fund all these new uh, requirements that are being thrown at our teachers and our staff. So I agree, it's not fair, but it's a reality we face um, with you know, what amounts to limited resources, which are always taxpayers' resources. Um, and let us not forget that it's the taxpayers that are funding all this, um, and, it, and we're quite lucky that they agreed to do so. That's my only point on that, so thank you. And thank you, Tom. Nancy, do you have something? Yeah, just follow up. Given, you know, fairs is maybe not the right word because we're looking at a budget holistically, I agree. Um, but when you also think about taxpayers and the breakdown of who's utilizing these facilities and the schools and the resources, um, again, I just encourage us what may be an overall spread around the number of taxpayers, given that it's 0.2 something percent versus what it might do to the kids. I think that that is probably. Um, a more appropriate approach to um, deciding whether or not that this is a cut that that is worth it, given what potential harm it could do to the students. And no one is accusing anyone of intentionally wanting to do harm. So what I would say is that, um, you know, what I've said in the past, and, you know, I served on the Board of Ed for six years, so there's always an increase. And, and, and that, you know, that word gets thrown around cut. It, it's a reduction to the increase. Um, it's a it's a large increase, but it's much smaller than it has been in the past, and I am grateful for that. Um, there's all way, there are all kinds of ways to fix things, and you know just to be cognizant, we all support our schools. They don't just um, they aren't just an asset to the families who move here who have children in them. They're an asset to every single taxpayer in this town because they are an asset. And they make our house values more, and they make this community more vibrant, and they're important, 100% important. But again, we are living in unprecedented times. Inflation rates are extraordinarily high, and people's salaries are not jumping up to the, meet those inflationary costs. And you know, I've spent a considerable amount of time as the chief elected official of this town agonizing over budget details for months, for months you know, public safety, all kinds of things that I would have per liked to have given extra to, but I had to be careful because I don't want to hit our taxpayers with huge increases. Every single thing I'm presented with during the budget, internal budget meetings, makes sense to me. I want to give it away. I want to give everybody everything they want. Trust me, I do. But at the end of the day, I have to be cognizant of the people in this town. And one of the great things that, you know, Tom Flynn brought up you know, he said, you know, where are the apples to apples comparisons to other towns? Well, personally, I think Fairfield beats all those other towns. I think we're better than Greenwich, Darien, New Canaan, because we're diverse. We're way more diverse in those communities. This community is an amazing community for a lot of reasons. But what that diversity means, there are people who are living paycheck to paycheck. There are seniors out there who are really having a tough time, like they live on fixed incomes. I hear from them as the chief elected official every day. And so, you know, it was really important to me to keep it under a 1% uh, because I want to make sure we keep that diversity, that we have people who aren't really wealthy um, and people who are not just middle, um, middle income, you know, but the people who have worked hard to achieve the opportunity to live in this town or who lived here their whole lives and built this community and wanted to stay here. So, um, I mean, ask Carol Martin what her waiting list looks like for affordable housing. It's like ridiculous. Um, so 
just trying to make sure our, I'm not trying to hurt our kids, I'm just trying to make sure our town is affordable. And I believe that um, Mr. Destani and his entire uh, team are able to uh, make sure that none of our students are negatively impacted in any way. So I just wanted to say that. Okay. Sure. Um, thank you for that, and I appreciate what you said. Um, it'd be, I'd be interested, Jared, in just literally the math and what it does to the percentage increase so we can be making the most informed decision. Um, keeping that $500,000, could, could you let us know if it's not back of the napkin math, because it's certainly not for me, uh, what it would do to that yeah, overall percentage? Thank you. Sure. And what it, that would look like. I just think it's important to know what it is we're talking about in reality with how it impacts the overall budget. So. I just want to, while he's figuring that out, to what Mr. Flynn mentioned earlier, I do want to just say that uh, regarding the surplus and the transfers, that is reflected in this ask. I, I, I do want to make sure that that's clear that um, without those transfers that this ask would have been a little bit higher for the record. So just to, so it is reflected. Um, because we're able to do some things this year that we, we don't have to kick out to next year. So, so if I'm dumbing that down, it means that it's not that all of a sudden you realized, oh, we asked for more and you didn't spend it, so we're giving it back. Is that true? C can you repeat that? Meaning it's not like you overestimated uh, what you'd be spending. You were able to put it in other ways. Correct. It's not like, Correct. oh, Correct. we over-budgeted for $2 million. Correct. Okay. Correct. I Correct. just wanted to spell that out. Let me respond to that for a second. Go ahead, Tom. If it, yeah, if it's, um, and I'm not, a, Mr. Testani wasn't here at the time, okay, but if you go back and you look over the last many years at the Board of Education, okay, and I'm not saying it's millions of dollars, but at the Board of Education, you'll see a whole bunch of spending that takes place in May and June. And by the way, I'm not even saying it's wrong, okay? But when the budget isn't used up at May and June, in good years, they go back and spend a lot of money in May and June, okay? And, and they eat up whatever's left up in their budget to assist them with the next year. That's how it's always been done. So to the extent that there's surplus this year, that surplus can be used to offset a minimal increase of $500,000 in the next coming year. Um, and again, I'm not implying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not implying that it's untoward in any way. I'm just saying there's, when you're dealing with a budget that's so large, there's always puts and takes in those budgets. You're never going to budget exactly. And 0.2% uh, uh, is not a hard putt in any budget of this size, in any budget actually of any size. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Nick? Yeah, and just just to touch on that really quickly, um, I, I think credit should be given to the to the board and the administration for taking a proactive approach um, this year in trying to do these transfers ahead of time, ahead of when we know what the budget's going to be. Because when you when you're trying to spend down money in May and June, um, y you weren't you weren't factoring that in um, to to the next year's budget. Um, it, it was being used potentially as an offset, yes. But in this case, I think the the new superintendent and his administration um, were forward thinking here. Um, and I believe this budget that they've put forward that the board supported um, is a fiscally responsible budget and not anticipating large surpluses, you know, moving forward, barring anything outside of our, you know, control. This past year, transportation and para vacancies played a big role in that. If we had had the bus drivers, um, you know, that that are just not there, uh, we would have been running more routes, we would have been running more special ed runs, uh, we would have been filling more vacancies, and, and the number would not have been that great. So I just wanted to you know, put that on the record that I think this move this year, um, the way we've handled it, is, is fiscally responsible and hopefully moving forward um, will we'll always potentially have a swing one way or the other, but um, it's not like we're uh, padding it. Thank you, Nick. And, and you bring up the bus, actually, I, I'm interested to know. I know that this is an issue across the state regarding the shortages. How are you guys, uh, I mean, is there like any state incentives that are coming out that you're hearing about to help with Not that? Yet, but we are seeing some relief. We've added a few bus drivers in the last couple of weeks, which is encouraging, I think. Um, we've made some changes in the transportation department that has resulted in um, 
I think things are, are starting to ease up a little bit. That, that could have been part of the issue as well. So we're hopeful okay. that as we move further into the rest of this year and into next year that um, the issues that we started the year with will not be the same uh, come 23-24. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. I have, if you like it, I have that mill rate increase related to the 500000 it would take the increase to um, a point where it's at right now, 0.98 to 1.13 percent. And, and I, I just want to um, give kind of a big picture view. And I, when uh, we met with Superintendent Testani, um, I brought this up then to um, about the increases in the education budget. You know, if you look at this year's increase and going forward where it looks like we're kind of on a trend to do seven, eight million dollars a year. To put that into perspective, that's that's over two mills worth of an increase in the um, in the budget and, and to taxpayers. And in the past year, past two years, we've been pretty fortunate that we've had you know things like a large property sale um, that we got a, a lot of revenue from. So we, we've been fortunate that we've been able to absorb a lot of those increases just because of the, you know, by uh, in a lot of ways by happenstance because we had a, a few things fall our way. We had, you know, increases in conveyance tax and uh, golf revenue related to COVID. Um, the future, uh, the near future, I don't see a lot of that happening. Um, and so I think we're going to be left with the basic increase that we get from um, e either revaluation or, or changes in properties, which usually amount to about uh, probably around $3 million a year, 3 to $4 million a year. And so that is not enough to keep pace with the, the spending in education alone. And so, you know, there, there's a, a trend here where um, there, there's, there are going to be uh, tax increases um, if there's not some, you know, more effort. And I think uh, Superintendent Testani, this is, this is a, a great first step, what you did with the budget this year. And, um, you know, hopefully it's something for us to build on. But big picture, there's, uh, we've been doing pretty well because we've had some things fall our way, but I don't see a lot of that happening in the, in the n near future. Um, are there any other additional questions from the board? Um, Nancy? This may not be something that could happen, but in terms of like any of the COVID relief opportunities from the town side, is that something we could think about ap ap applying to offset from an operation standpoint um, a cut? What do you mean COVID I don't know. Relief? Is there any like of the grant money or... ARPA funding or anything? Well, ARPA to... funding can't be used for operational expenses uh, necessarily. Um, and that would, you know, that obviously creates a cliff uh, it, to, to right. a certain extent. Um, our ARPA funds are pretty much all uh, accounted for. We do have uh, an amount that we're keeping in uh, at bay because we know that with uh, costs and supply chain and all of that, we don't want to make sure that the commitments we have made that um, when they do go up and we in we feel like they will, uh, that we have that ability to um, to jump in and pay for those. Yeah, I remember that it was like something in excess, a little bit of a million, and yeah, I remember that conversation. I just wonder if we could think, just something to think about, to maybe offsetting and splitting the difference, or I'm just trying to find a way to, to look at this very tight budget and try to, and I know everyone's compromising, but to even sort of meet them a little bit more. I mean, to give you a sense, you know, I mean, with all of the needs that I, you know, that I've been requested, or even the needs of our town, the things I would like to do, I mean, I got a lot more out of my original budget than, than what's being proposed here. Um, and the town obviously makes up a much smaller percent. And, and that's, you're talking fire, police, library, Parks and Rec, you know, in the health, I mean, you can go on, DPW, you know, all of these things that make our town run. Um, you have to make adjustments. I, I, I don't think, um, listen, I don't think any, um, 
anyone who's really looking at the numbers or in, in crunching numbers in a responsible way is just going to say beautiful budget and not going to change it at all. It's just, it's just not the way the real world works. Yeah. Um, and we all do this at home, you know, when all of our oil bills went up. Uh, I mean, you know, we all made adjustments, right? Because when, when a dozen eggs cost 10 bucks, you make an adjustment um, to what your, because your budget's not changing at home, your paycheck's not pay changing. Um, and so you make adjustments and, and we, we do the same things in, in, in town budgeting to a certain extent. Um, and this is my lowest uh, reduction yeah, no, to an I'm increase, just, Nancy. Just, I mean, a gotcha. you know, a million, two million. I think I'm, I'm trending downward, downward. This is really meant. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe Mr. Testani is going to come up with a budget next year where I'm just going to go, thumbs up. Looks well, good maybe to me. This be the year. Um, you know, it's really not meant. This is meant to be a conversation and um, to come up with creative solutions for the betterment of everybody. And, um, you know, yesterday or Wednesday, I spent a lot of time asking, is it enough? I kept asking every department head. I know a lot goes into it before I arrive on the scene um, as a board. And maybe that, too, is a problem. But, you know, department head after department head said, it is enough. And here I see a department saying, this is what we need. And then we're pushing back and saying, yeah, you're the professionals, but. And I appreciate everything that you've both said. I just... Um, think that uh, it's a conversation and maybe these are some of the things that we can think about over the next couple of days and maybe there are creative ways because I just trust what the board has come to us with and what the superintendent has come to us with and um, I am inclined to give them the tools that they've asked for including all the other department heads who I literally said are you sure it's not enough staff are you sure you know it's enough staff so that's all um, not trying to be contrarian or difficult or... Well, no, I think you know, that you get there over time. And like we discussed at our budget hearing on Wednesday, um, you know, when you ask those questions of our department heads, these are the questions that I ask. We have a very free-flowing um, back-and-forth discussions. And so you look at it, you know, you look at the big picture and you try to get there in incremental ways. And so that's what I'm doing with when the department head comes to me and says, you know, I want, you know, two things. And I'll say, okay, well, let's get one of those for you this year and let's talk about getting the other next year. And so we keep moving incrementally toward the, the, the bigger goal um, to get there. And so, again, I think we, you know, we've discussed... Um, you know, we undertook an energy audit. I think that the school district can can expand on their energy audit. Um, we've been asking for a while on that. I think we can achieve quite a bit of savings in something like that. Um, that wasn't wouldn't touch a single um, educational um, program. So there are ways. There's creative ways. I mean, if you look through the budget book. Um, I mean, there are, you know, not everything is instructional or programmatic. And so I just um, saying to you that I believe, and I didn't just pick 500000 out of a hat, you know, I believe that this can be absorbed. And again, <laughs> I spent six years on the Port of Ed. I, I mean, I used to sit there, I write notes and highlight. I mean, I used to scrutinize my Board of Ed budget like a hawk. Um, and believe me, I used to find a lot more than $500,000, like... It can happen. So that's just my two cents. Sure. Um, I just, you know, from from the board's perspective, obviously, um, you know, we're not going to sit here and go back and forth, you know, over five hundred thousand dollars. It, it's it's, um, but. Uh, just to make the point from the board that the board did, you know, pass this budget and the number that was passed is the request. Um, is that to say that it's doom or gloom if we're cut 100, 200, 300, 400, 500? As Carol said, we don't know where that's going to come from, but that is work no matter where this winds up um, that this board is committed to doing and making sure that we provide the best possible education. So. Um, you know, I will say, representing the board as a whole here, our ask is for the 4.05 percent, and that's um, what we want. But I do appreciate the dialogue that's gone back, back and forth here amongst all the parties, um, because I think that will, you know, go back um, to whatever this ultimately winds up being after it gets through the three town bodies. Appreciate it too. I have a question. Okay. Is there any additional questions, Tom, from you? 
Well, Ted, I want to thank, uh, once again, I want to thank the superintendent and his team as well as the Board of Education for their work and effort on the budget. Thanks so much. And, and actually, uh, uh, thanks to Brenda and Nancy for their commentary as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It's good to see you. That's it. Giddy up. <laughs> hour and a half, right? Or is that? Yeah. That's an hour. Well, an hour and a half, yes. And um, I'm just going to. Um, oh, um, no, because we're going to. Oh, yeah, no problem. Mark Barnhart got squeezed in here because she wanted it. So I, I, that's what we did. He shouldn't be long. You don't have much with Mark, do you? Okay, because he did a presentation for the finance and he does constant things. All right, Mark, you're up. All right, just he's going to be ten minutes. Real quick, okay. All right, Mark. Is it <laughs> the hot seat? <laughs> hot, hot buns. Oh. So, Mark, Mark, if you just want to give a quick overview, um, we didn't originally have you on the agenda, but Nancy had requested you just come and speak. Uh, we, we, I know Tom has a hard stop mm -hmm. at three uh, because he has to travel, okay. and there's some items that I know he has to. Um, one other item, so I just want to be uh, mention that. Oh, I'll, I'll keep it very brief. There I mean, it's it's uh, it's very much uh, the same uh, as last year. Very little change. Uh, in fact, uh, other than uh, salary and benefit lines, uh, other than uh, we did uh, provide funding for the uh, newly formed Arts Commission, uh, requesting an appropriation of a thousand dollars to just uh, put a line item there and some funding to to start their work. Um, so happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry. Can we? There's a lot of cross talk. Go uh, ahead, Tom. Just, uh, yeah. You couldn't hear. Oh, okay. I'm just having problems here. Okay, here sorry. Thanks. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, thank you for coming before us. I know this was not originally scheduled, but I felt very strongly and really compelled to have you come before the, the board so that in this uh, domain, the public could hear from you because I'm very excited that the town um, has made it an investment as small as it is financially so far uh, for, the, for the newly formed Arts Commission. And it's incredibly encouraging the number of applicants we've got. There's obviously a lot of benefits to that. And I just wanted to hear you talk about some of the things that, one, why the $1,000? And I'm leading the witness because I know the answer. Um, but why the $1,000 and sort of what you hope um, having this arts commission and a, and a focus on the arts in the town is going to do? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, just briefly, we have a newly formed arts commission. It hasn't been impaneled yet. Obvi we have uh, requested uh, those that are interested in serving on the arts commission to, to apply. And as you mentioned, we've um, had an overwhelming response from really high quality candidates, I think. So we have a lot of very qualified individuals from which to choose from. A lot of people very much engaged and interested in serving in this capacity. Um, we put aside a thousand dollars based on conversations that I had both with you and through you to the state uh, of Connecticut uh, as to uh, the ability then to leverage that investment uh, to secure other uh, arts related grants on behalf of the town. So um, it's my understanding that uh, these types of investments, small as they may be, will uh, certainly make the town eligible to receive arts related funding. I don't have any specific um, proposals in terms of how those funds, the thousand dollars, would be utilized other than to further the work of the commission once it's been impaneled. It would certainly be my expectation that we would have the Arts Commission impaneled before the end of this uh, fiscal year. And then we would start the work in terms of identifying what our priorities are. But some of the things that we're currently working on um, is um, uh, certainly there's a lot of interest in establishing an arts and cultural district. 
uh, in town. Uh, that's been a conversation I've had with our uh, tourism partners, including the, both the universities and Fairfield Theater Company and the Shoe Community Theater as well. So there's great interest in establishing that. Um, we've also had conversations with um, a number of folks, including the Parking Authority, as to whether or not there might be opportunities to incorporate public art into public spaces. Uh, perhaps a mural installation, had conversations with uh, the City of Bridgeport, downtown special services district that did a similar uh, call to artists um, most recently. And I think if any of you have been downtown Bridgeport, you've seen some of the, the benefit of that work. And so, and this is a very small step, but I think once, um, uh, once we have uh, a working commission, uh, they'll be able to further identify their needs going forward. Um, and just a follow-up question, the $1,000, will that, is that able to be used towards the commission and any needs that they might have in terms of, so it doesn't have to be designated to something specific? No, it okay, does so not. It just has to be a line item. Correct. As we discussed. And then, um, including possibly a mural at the train, could you talk a little bit more about the timing that you hope to, um, to see in terms of the Arts Commission? and? Well, uh, as are you ready to get to work with them once they? I'm ready to get to work. I know the Parks and Rec your director is also um, ex officio, I believe, ex officio staff to the commission as well. So I know we've both talked about it, and we're uh, looking forward to working with the commission once it's been seated. Great. And all the things, all the benefits to a community, not just attracting tourism, but the the mental health, the social emotional life of a community. Is, val is greatly enhanced by, by art and public art. So thrilled I to see this and that's totally agree. So thank you, I'm glad you had a chance, at least th that's no more for me. I just wanted you to have the chance to come before this body and so I could show it off with you because I'm very, very excited. Appreciate that. Madam Chairwoman. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, first of all, um, good news or bad news, my flight has been delayed so I have a little <laughs> bit longer than the three o'clock. Um, and secondly, since Mr. Barnhart is here, how are you, Mark? I'm very well. Thank you. Good. Quick question for you since you're here. Talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of economic development, commercial real estate and the like in the town of Fairfield, if you would, right now. I know it's been a challenging time overall for commercial real estate. I know Fairfield's done well in terms of new business opportunities over the last year or so, and congratulations on that. But well, what's going on out there right now as we're, we're looking at our tax base? Well, I think some of the headwinds that the first Leck woman identified, uh, even in her brief remarks that I caught with respect to the Board of Ed, uh, they're not unique to Fairfield. Um, we, we've seen, and uh, many businesses are having to deal with supply chain disruptions, inflationary pressures, a tight labor market, all those things, obviously, a rising interest rate environment, obviously, all those things have a, an impact in terms of uh, business growth and development. But this, by the same token, uh, I think you know, we've more than held our own. Um, you know, vacancy rates are, are declining. Uh, we did see a brief uh, increase in our vacancy rate overall for both office and retail uh, during the peak of the pandemic. It's never reached the heights of other parts of Fairfield County, and so our vacancy rates are still quite low relative to other parts of the county. But by the same token, um, you know, as I mentioned to the Board of Finance in my remarks to them, it would be very hard for me to envision a lot of new office uh, development when uh, there's such, um, uh, such considerable supply in the marketplace um, in Fairfield County. So uh, we do see, you know, there has been significant investment. Um, Institutionally, obviously, we've seen both universities make significant investments in their on-campus on facilities, and, and that work continues in terms of new residence halls. They just put in place uh, new sports arenas, and that contributes to the vibrancy of the town, uh, town as well. Um, and we've seen you know, a lot of uh, interest in residential um, and mixed-use residential, particularly around transit. And we've encouraged that in the area around Fairfield Metro. Um, so 
there is uh, work. We, we do have some office uh, being constructed, the new 25,000 square foot medical office building across from the Hotel Hi Ho on uh, Black Rock Turnpike uh, underway, um, as well as a new veterinary hospital on Greenfield Hill, uh, mixed use uh, development downtown. So um, I think we are due for some uh, retrenchment or pause in some of our commercial activity. We had a pretty banner year last year, uh, over $100 million in new investments. And, that, and I include in that commercial uh, the institutional investments that uh, I've talked about. But uh, if you look at the trend line, typically when we have such periods of robust growth, uh, we also see you know, then uh, a period where people take a collective pause, catch their breath uh, before we see more uh, projects uh, emerge in the pipeline. Um, so I think we're probably due to see a little bit less activity from a construction standpoint in the next 12 to 24 months. But there are other projects in the pipeline that I do think that overall Fairfield remains a very attractive place to invest in and I don't see any um, diminution in the level of interest from from businesses or companies that want to invest here. Uh -oh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Is there anything additional for Mark? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Barnhart. Thank you for coming down. You're welcome. Just want to mention that uh, for the record that Mark is amazing and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he and I work very, no very closely together on a whole host of projects, working with uh, potential uh, opportunities throughout the town, and um, we're very lucky to have him. So thank you, Mark. All right. Um, our next item um, is um, follow-up on health insurance, and I am going to ask um, just to be uh, sort of... Um, Cautious, I would like to get a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Tom? Sorry, seconded. I was saying that to a muted mic. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right, we're going to go into executive session. Um, <clears throat> Good. Good. Okay. Can I get a motion uh, to come out of executive session? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Tom? Aye. Okay. I just want to note for the record uh, there was no votes taken in executive session. Okay, our next item is um, 3010, page 100, um, discussing finance. And I'll hand it over to Jared. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, our, the finance department's operating budget is pretty straightforward. Um, We've got the increases in there for um, the any of the uh, bargaining units that have settled. Uh, and I also have an increase in there for educational and memberships. Um, this is mostly related to uh, the potential for training because we are continuing to look at new systems for uh, new software for things like uh, capital planning and uh, and the like, so um, we added uh, $5,000 for that. Um, other than that, I don't have any other changes to talk about. Are there any questions? I'm just curious more um, what that 10,000 number, and again, not a huge nugget. I just had it as one of my questions. Sorry, I wasn't recognized. No, go right ahead. I'm yes, very sure. now that I have this microphone in front of me. <laughs> um, what what 
accounts for it because it last in 2022 it was 1454. So I'm just curious. Like, I know you're saying trainings, but an $8,500 jump is a big one. Yeah. So we're we're ramping up, and we added the 5,000 to to the current year's budget. Um, during COVID, there wasn't a lot of trainings going on. Um, and so now with the, um, uh, with things opening up, you know, there may be, uh, uh, you know, statewide or regional conferences or, um, things like that. And also, um, um, I'm making a greater effort to, uh, get staff trained, any kind of, uh, training on, on new subjects or, um, revisiting and getting, uh, updated on on older subjects and um, the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, is the um, you know the the main group that uh, several of us belong to, and uh, they offer a lot of training. Some of them are in person, some of them are um, online, um, and they uh, you know they typically they can run anywhere from uh, you know. Three to five hundred dollars per um, per session, and so it, it can add up pretty quickly. Can I? Sure, go right ahead. And then the org chart, just at adding. Are any of these positions still outstanding? Yes. Or is it all filled? Third. Nope. I have I have one that's outstanding, which is you know labeled the DPW finance position. Um, it's actually going to be a little bit broader than that, but most of the focus will be on DPW. Um, we had this was kind of a um, there was a ripple effect. Um, I don't I don't have space. I don't have physical space for another body right now in the department, and so we it's taken time. I I had to go downstairs where we keep a lot of our um, a lot of our files that have been accumulating for years and years. There were literally, um, we, we got rid of, got rid of, and we, we didn't come close to getting rid of everything. We got rid of 426 boxes, I believe, worth of, and these are bankers boxes. Um, and that's only going up through 20, there, I wanna say 2016, I believe. Um, but what that allows me to do is to, we have also some files that have been backed up and backed up into the department office. So now I can take those, move them downstairs, um, and hopefully keep up with that, um, that backlog and get rid of those more, get rid of some of those files more often um, and free up space so that I can put another, uh, another station in there. And to clarify, you know, when, when we, when we uh, dispose of records, they have to have actually have to be yes. reviewed in detail. So it's not like you just pick up a box and toss it. It has to be reviewed to make sure there aren't important documents, there's a backup online, and all of this other stuff. So it is a tedious and time-consuming process. Um, in addition to that, the original um, the original uh, job description that we had uh, put together for this position wasn't really grabbing um, what we needed. And so we made some um, adjustments and we're hoping now that we'll have the opportunity to recruit uh, the appropriate candidate for that position. And obviously the HR department now being fully staffed is really, is much more helpful because um, they're crucial in, in part of that as well. Yeah, and in addition to what the first select woman saying about the, you know, the internal reviews and making sure that we're not uh, you know, that we're getting rid of the proper things. We also had to comply with um, the state and their retention. their records retention policies and, you know, make sure that, um, you know, we weren't getting rid of anything before uh, that the right amount of time has, has lapsed, depending on whatever the documents are. I would, um, the one last thing I would say is in terms of the staff, um, I do know that it's an extraordinarily tight market for finance staff. Um, e even for very young and inexperienced, I've seen that with my own son, that um, there's a lot of poaching going on. There's a lot of um, a lot of competition for, for any type of talent out there. So I think 
to invest in training and the like and to make sure your job descriptions and things are buttoned up are is probably very prudent in this marketplace. Agreed. Great. Is there any additional questions on this item? Do you want to um, do you want to take a look at the revenue side on page 13? I can go. I can hit some of the highlights. Um, you know, we've we've spoken about the uh, interest, and I I will follow up with a, a document um, per your request, Tom. Um, I'll follow up with a document to you guys probably uh, by the end of the day today, um, just to give you a sense of where that uh, that investment is coming from that would be going to Janny. Um, there, there aren't a lot, a lot of other major changes here. Uh, there was so this, this is actually Jared, yeah. Jared, yeah. On the investment, my apologies for interrupting. Just for me to be clear, what I'm really interested in is how that average cash balance that he's he, he quoted that hundred million. Yes. I'm really interested as to how that was calculated and where that came from. Yep, I got so, it. Yeah. Okay, thank yep. you. You're welcome. Um, other than that, we had a couple of minor changes in uh, state grants. Um, everything else is pretty much uh, status quo here. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there are any any particular questions about um, any of the any of the uh, revenue items. Actually, I did have a question in terms of rents that are going up. Um, is this the right? Like, I noticed. Um, I noticed with the Fairfield. Sorry, I'm not being recognized. I'm just no, talking. <laughs> I noticed with the Fairfield Theater Company, for instance, it's um, an increase in rent. Um, just have they been notified? What ju what's justifies it? Why are some increases less than others? Um, we could always ask Mark Barnhart for more information, but um, these numbers come from him and um, Connie in the finance office. And so these are agreed upon numbers. It's, they're not like we increase the rent and we don't tell them. Um, and, it, and I think it's just based on some of the descriptions here are, um, they don't necessarily reflect, reflect maybe the, the business that's there, but they're more tied to an address. Um, and it's just that this is kind of the name in, in, in Munis for them. So that's why you may see some rents fluctuate, um, but it's really just based on any agreement that uh, economic development comes to with these leases. And um, yeah, it it's, wouldn't be a surprise to them. So by the time it gets here, then it's been negotiated and we're gonna, we can count on them coming back for this amount. And it's not like it's been increased and maybe they're not coming back and we potentially risk losing it. Correct. Okay. Is there anything else on this item? All right, move to, you want to move to debt service? And that's, um, I'm sorry, page 221. Um, we tell everybody, is everybody on the page? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll just go from the top to the bottom so you can see um, FY23 to FY24, the cost to market bonds and bans, um, and those would be you know the, like the legal fees for going to market for those. That's not changing. We kept that at 150,000 just based on what we've done this year and and, and speaking to the people that help us. Um, the notable change comes in the principal um, and, and interest due. Um, actually, sorry, the principal. Uh, the principal due on just on the long-term bonds in general is decreasing from about 18.5 million to 16.7 million, and what's adding, uh, what, what, what's benefiting us also is our use of bond premium to offset the debt service. So the, this bond premium is um, increasing from 1.5 million to 1.9 million. So that would get us a net principal due um, of 14.7 million, which 
um, is a large decrease from the prior year. Um, interest is um, going up a little bit. The interest due on long-term bonds is, is just from our debt schedule. The estimated interest due January 24th on long-term bond issuances is a, is a prorated amount for issuances that we do or will do in FY24 for part of the year, so part of that first year of the issuance. Um, and that's also calculated from a, um, uh, you know, an estimate from our, from our uh, uh, Phoenix advisors. Uh, principal pay down on bond anticipation notes also decreasing from 550 to 90,500. Um, interest due on bands um, also also decreasing. Notably, though, we got less bond premium on on the bands that we issued um, recently, so we're not seeing as much <coughs> bond premium. But the principal is also decreasing. So sorry, the interest is also decreasing. Um, the principal due on state loan for clean water fund that was the last year. FY twenty three was the last year for that. Um, so, you know, after accounting for all the increases, decreases, we're going from a debt service budget of $24.2 million to a debt service budget of $22 million. So it's a it's a 8% um, increase, or I believe a little bit more um, than that. So I can go over any questions anybody has. Hey, quick question here. This has all been... Uh all these calculations have been gone over with our outside advisors relative to our debt service and that. Yeah, so I I um, I send them and and we go back and forth on these calculations and uh, Caitlin also checks them and and I also show them to Jared. So we vet them. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. No no other comments from me right now. Thank you. Um, you have Not for this, no. Um, next one is retiree benefits. I'll open that up. What page? Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. What's the page on that? That's 79. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I don't have any questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the um, OPEB, I'll talk, I'll cover OPEB first. Um, we, similar to last year and um, the pension calculations from last year, this is the first time that an OPEB uh, valuation is being done uh, since we moved to our new actuary, Milliman, because um, as I think everybody knows, we do the OPEP valuation once every two years, not every year. And so um, there was a, uh, there's been some delay in getting an actual number for the, uh, for the cost of OPEP, uh, the ADEC as it's known and what we put into the budget. And um, but I have had continual conversations with them. I expect to get a number from them probably within the next week, I hope. Um, but I did, uh, as I said, I, I had, have had conversations with them. They've given a range of um, what the number could be. Um, and so we, um, you know, we, we, we went more conservative and put in a higher number than you know the average of that range, and so that's what we're what that's what we're uh, assuming right now. That could change. So when so when we said in the write up that we fully funded the ADEC on OPEB, we did it based on best available information. But it, it, we haven't. We don't have the final information. So and we're not going to have it by Monday. So the board of finance may be adjusting this one way or the other. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It was right. I think you put it exactly right. It was based on our best yeah. estimate and uh, conversations with the actuary. Yeah, which is all you can do. I understand that at this point. I'm disappointed that the, the work isn't done yet, but I get it. On the, on the retirement contributions, though, I am astonished that it's the same amount year over year, except if you're saying that the amount 
that they calculated was lower than last year so that we put the floor at last year. Is that what this implies or what's this implying? So this is uh, implying that uh, we don't we don't have a final number for this one, but I got a uh, verbal communication from them that it's going to be uh, flat. It, it, it will be flat. Um, so could there be a you know a, a ten or twenty thousand dollar change one way or another? Uh, that's that's possible, but it's going to be uh, it, it'll be basically yeah. flat. Um, sure. The um so that you're aware, and I hope the Board of Finance sticks to this policy, we, we implemented a policy when I was there. We, we referred to it as do no harm. And that policy was never go, go below last year's funding in aggregate, right? Um, the thought process being that it ebbs and flows and we got burned, particularly in the Madoff scandal, pretty, pretty badly. Mm. So I, I would hope that they stick with that and that, you know, this will be the low point that they go which is funding it at last year. And then if unfortunately it comes back and says it needs more funding, that they would go with whatever the ADAC provides over and above last year. Okay. Um, okay. This, this seems, um, I'm astonished at this. I'm astonished at two things. I'm astonished that it's, um, that they've signaled to you that it would be flat because uh, even with the five year smoothing, the markets and returns on investment took such a hit that I, I'm astonished that it's flat. And the second thing is I'm, I'm astonished too, that they don't have these numbers. I mean, typically we would get these numbers in the, in the December timeframe. So to get them, you know, we're sitting here towards the end of February and not have them yet. I'm, I'm disappointed in that actually. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they were pretty, um, Pretty adamant that it wasn't gonna that, that it's not gonna move much at all. So they had they had enough of a sense to be able to to make a statement like that. Um, yeah. I, but uh, you know I, I'll say right the the smoothing I think helps us out a lot because if you think about the um, you know the, the market and the and the way it has been. Um, also that this is you know when they look at this and they do their valuation it, it's through. Um, to fiscal year 22. Um, and so they, and the way I look at it in terms of the investment income and returns on investment is that, uh, you know, we effectively picked up uh, now to another fifth because they smoothed it out over five years. So we picked up another fifth of a gigantic investment year uh, to the positive. And we picked up, you know, a fifth of a uh, you know a, a bad year, but it wasn't nearly as bad as the good was good. The that good year was was phenomenal, where we were you know we, you know, we made somewhere around thirty percent, twenty seven thirty percent. So it was it was uh, far outweighed the the bad year. Yeah, we're trending in the wrong direction. I mean, I I, I know you're right, and I know exactly what's happening. I'm concerned what this is going to be moving forward. You know, and I, as that gets, go ahead. Uh, so I'll re, um, restate something that uh, came up in the JRIB meeting, the retirement board meeting, um, which is that you know our Vanguard, who's our um, OCR, OCIO um, for the pension funds. When they go out and they project out based on the um, our portfolio, our por portfolio, uh, they're you know they're estimating that we're going to re return more than seven percent. And as you know, we we just uh, reduced the discount rate to six point nine percent. And so they're you know they're they're confident over the long run that this portfolio that we have in place right now is going to. Return over the long haul uh, at a rate over seven percent. So, um, you know, and and sometimes it's easy to get easy to get stuck in oh you know what what's happening this year and and what's gonna you know what what's gonna be the the impact this year. But over the long run, because it's a retirement fund and because we're talking about investing for the long term, you know that those are the things that we're that we're really looking at. Right. Okay. Is there any additional um, questions on this? 
section? No, I just look. I just look forward to seeing what the final is here. I, I we don't have any better information to go on, and I'm comfortable with the fact that with both OPEB and retirement, that it's both at or above last year. Um, hopefully, the Board of Finance will have those final reports in order to make a determination of. Yeah, and I'm with you, Tom, especially on the OPEB. I'm, uh, you know, interested to see how that turns out. All right. Um, our next Thanks, Jared. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next item, active employee benefits. I've actually got to cut out now. I've stayed as long as I could. Okay. So, All right, Tom. You. Safe trip. Thank you. Okay. That's what we would have went over that with the health insurance. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. Very good. All right. Well, um, I am going to, uh, now that we've concluded our agenda, I will open it up as we did on Wednesday. <laughs> Um, we opened up for public comment, and I will open it up again for public comment. There's no one in the room, but um, is there? It's very weird to talk to an empty room. I know. I do have some. It looks scarier than it is. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's, you know, it's so strange. When I used to come to Board of Selectmen meetings when I was on the RTM, maybe it was the issues of the day, you know, like the high school and everything was so, everybody's hair was on fire, but... But I mean, this room would be packed, and they would be lined up down we're the not hall as and down the hall because people all were interested um, in that item and discussions. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment on the WebEx? Considering there's no one in the room, <laughs> two public two budget hearings in a row, and we didn't have any. I have. That um, means it's perfect. Everybody loves it. <laughs> I just have some questions remaining, which are quick. All right, quick. Uh, all right, I'm going to pull back to the board. And Nancy, go right ahead. Um, as I said, I mean, this is, well, I'm going to say it now. Um, I think overall, I said it in the very beginning, um, there's a lot of really good things in this budget. And um, I feel really optimistic about some of the some of the things in here. I do have some outstanding questions that I'd love answered before Monday um, so that we can get to a unanimous yes, I imagine, or at least my support. On page nine, and I just did a run through and some of it's quick. So on page nine, um, I noticed that the reserve for unsettled contracts is is a lot less than last year. And I just wanted to understand, is it that just the timing of where the contracts are? Because um, it's pretty significant. Yeah, do you want to? We could answer that. Yeah, yeah. Anything that we can answer now is yeah, great, great because. Yeah, that's really because um, a lot of contracts were settled. So last year in contingency, um, we had even even though PETA had been settled, it was settled around April, I think, but it was too late in the process to kind of incorporate those numbers into the actual departments. So we left that in contingency. The same thing happened with the police department. So those are two two contracts there that, um, y you know, basically, you know, are, were in contingency last year that aren't this year. Um, and, and you can add DPW and THEA to that. Um, so, you know, taking out four contracts, even with the reserve for the unsold contracts we have, it's still a net, a net decrease to that line. Okay. And you feel comfortable with that completely because of all the, the four major contracts? Yeah. yeah like, like, you know, a, a, as you notice when, when the numbers come up and I see that, you know, I'm always, sometimes things are too good to be true, so I get worried, so I go back and check, but... I'm, I'm confident okay. because of that. I go back and check them. All right, great. Um, on page 26, the library fines have doubled. Is it, do we? I don't know if that's something you can answer now, but that feels like a, also, like what? Why? I could I could just ask him. All right. Um, page six. I'm sorry. Page um, 26. Oh, page 26. 26. Where is it? What one? Um, oh. So, yep. Um, the actual was 36 from 22, and it went up to 48. Yeah. So curious about that. Uh, da, da, rent income. Talk about some of this. On page 51, in administrative services, a line item for 11K and 33 on page 51. Just curious what that is. And again, I know we're not talking about individually like huge nuggets, but 
just want to know. What is page 51. What? Um, administrative services. There's an 11,000 rental and storage and um, 3 point. Oh, 3,300, not 33, for special departmental supplies. It just seems so nebulous. I, I'd have to look at the special departmental supplies, but the rental and storage, I believe, is for the rental and leases for the copiers in the town. So the rental and storage is for the copiers, and because we, I believe we lease the two copiers um, that are on the first floor and the second floor. The big ones. Yeah, the big, the big ones. It may be a couple other miscellaneous ones. Yeah, I'd be just curious. Page 62 in TPZ. Um, again, just the org chart. Want to see if there are any vacant positions. Um, Page and that, and is it reflective? 62. No, the, no, these are all filled. Okay. Um, something for HR. I was curious, and maybe they mentioned this. Are there... We're pretty close to fully full capacity in terms of um, employees. Yeah. Was there? Did they give us a number? What do you mean? A percentage or of how much they still have to fill vacancies? Oh, uh, it was you mean overall, overall? The whole town. Yeah. Uh, um, that number. Um, it, I mean, it's it's really a point in time number um, because it you know it it can change. Um, when people have asked about vacancies in the past, I usually look at like va like things that we know are vacant and, and feel like they'll stay vacant for a long time. Um, you I could, think there's turnover, right? Like in the in the police department and in the fire department, right? You yeah. have retirees, and then they recruit. They then they have to train and all of that. So I don't know if that's counted as a actual. But I'm just thinking outside of our um, public safety, like I think there may be, you know, some, as Bucky was explaining during DPW, right. like there's some um, turnover because we weren't paying um, right. a competitive rate. So last, last I spoke, so to your point, I, I wouldn't really, because I know that there's, that there's just a normal churn in like public safety, for example, in firefighters. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like count them in the vacancy number. Um, DPW. You know, last I spoke to them. Though I think we're gonna we fix some of the problems that were uh, in that former contract. That I think Bucky believes, as does Mr. Cattell, that we are going to be able to have. I mean, we're pretty good staff, but I think with the, some of the other maybe open positions, we'll. You know, Bucky said that during his. You know, has somebody has a CDL and they find out they can get a better deal. And okay. It's not a big number, is the point. No, yeah. no, it's, it's not going to be big. Um, I would say my biggest problem really overall with the whole budget is around legal, and that's some of the inbound calls that I've gotten have been around the concern because the way it's listed, and thank you for the Munis reports, but it would, it's 75. It would be, I think, beneficial for people and... They may not be here, but I've definitely gotten phone calls about this one and um, just a real understanding of where the numbers come from. Not so much what the number is, but what is like the $300,000 litigation number? How is it arrived at? Is it a three or average? Like whatever the answer is, is fine. I just think that people really do want to see yep. a better understanding of why and how and, and sort of, again, yes, the Munis reports are helpful, but um, what is this based on, especially since the fill pile litigation expenses are outside of that? And we don't need to talk about it now. And if you want to give me more information over the weekend or before Monday, I just think people see this and they feel like there's not, and again, not questioning the reality of what's needed. It's just there's too many, like, fill in the blank. Like, it feels like, oh, right. is this well, just an open I mean, wallet? It's, I mean, it's, well, it's gone. It, well, it's fluctuated. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, so, I don't think people really. Yeah, we'll absolutely. We'll probably have town attorney come and speak about it. But I think it would just be helpful you know, like for people. people. Realize like the simplest things, like the tax appeals, um, land use. Um, uh, it would just be good to hear it. Yep. Because again, not then, challenging like, the sued, number. You know, when we're sued and on a whole host of things that happen. If, if there's an FOI hearing up in um, where is it now? Weathersfield. Um, you know, 
town attorney typically will take those. So he'll drive up there and deal with that. There's a lot of little things, things you don't think about. But yeah, more we than happy to. to uh, and I, I d definitely appreciate it. So I, like I said, um, on page 98. I, yep. On that one, I can, I can speak to um, like just broadly, um, like the general litigation. That's really just based on an average um, of you know what we what we see in kind of in kind of cases. It's kind of bent, blended with the litigation, um, which if the town you know if the town attorney has to come back conservation's just because um, we we've just seen a tick down in the number of cases. Tax appeals is actually going up because although the docket of appeals that we have is is getting smaller, what appeals we do have left could go to trial. And so that reflects that from the attorney. And the employee labors really because the arbitration, uh, we expect that to complete be completed by the end of the fiscal year. And, um, and with uh, the, the more of the contracts, uh, we, we expect we'd be able to negotiate the contracts with the staff that we have in HR rather than ha hiring outside consultants. So that's why the employee labor number drop that's based on just an estimate from the HR director on miscellaneous things that they would need. And then, you know, even itemizing it out, like of the litigation, how much is it going to the town attorney versus outside counsel versus, you know, just kind of an understanding of, of what and who we're hiring outside of the town attorney. Right, like we had some, you know, um Whenever we go into executive session, there's exactly. some case and it's attorney, not a, you know, I don't, I half the time never know what you even are. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you don't realize all these little cases, um, things happen, right? Okay. Uh, um, what was the moving next case? right yeah. along, 98. Yep. Um, it's more, um, probably a discussion I will tune into at the Board of Finance level, but if there's like a 30 second, response in terms of contingency, the number's so different this year. Um, and again, I think it'd just be good to understand philosophically why, to remind us why the decision was made last year. And I can't remember if that was made at the Board of Finance level or, or if it was made at this table and why the difference this year. So that, that, that contingent, that relates to what I was saying about the reserve for yes. unsold contracts. Yeah, there's no, I can say um, that there's no general contingency budget in there in here. So last year, they, the uh, the board of finance decided to to reduce the general contingency, which is kind of like, you know, just uh, appropriation set aside in, in in case. That's not assumed in here. What what you see in here is just all contracts, which I I can't go into detail about what we have assumed for them because. Um, it's it's part of on ongoing negotiation. So, but but that's all the what we expect for all the contracts that are unsettled at this time. All right, um, and then again, a bigger discussion, probably not for today, and something I'll. Do you need anything else? I mean, on contingency. I it's not going to change my. Um, my vote, but I, you know, I, I'd be curious again to have a, a more, I'll listen to the discussions on why. I don't know if it can be broken out more. I always like more information um, to understand it. But if you're saying it's really just about the contracts, then in this what minute. The assumptions are what we. Yeah. If I walk away from here and I'm thinking about it and, or I'm asked follow up questions and I don't know. I may reach out to you yep. before Monday, but um, I'd asked this earlier and alluded to it on page 99 in terms of it's more a comment. Um, how and the way I look at it, the way it's set up, it really feels like not for profits are sort of being pitted against each other to fight for money. Um, that may not be the intention, it may not be the way, but it's sort of the way it's designed. Like I look at Fairfield Museum, and I thought, oh, great, they're going up $12,000 this year. But that's, it's really to cover um, expenses that they, for cleaning, you know, for taking care of certain properties. So it's not an increase. It's really just to cover those costs that they spend anyway. Um, so that is one question. Can you confirm that that's the case? And why is it written like this? Yeah, so they take care of a property, and it's like 12000 in income that they get, right, for from the town? So, so yeah, so they got 
the the town has an agreement to take care of its plural its property properties right um, but yeah that that twelve thousand is just per the agreement you know they're being reimbursed for the uh, for the work that they yeah for for kind of the work that they do on the property. right so why is it it does look though if you look at it like it looks like a budget increase yeah it's it's just because um, I mean, I, I think it's more of just um, how you how a person prefers to budget it, because the Fairfield Museum already had an appropriation, and and um, you know there's kind of a lot of good backup in what it has in prior years and and what that money is. Um, I just thought that we could keep it in there, um, but it, you know if somebody wanted to, they could split it the twelve thousand out as a separate appropriation. Um, it just I think it. it to me, it's misleading in the sense of you look at it and think, huh, we've been more generous with, the t with you know, to give them more money to function. And again, it's just covering expenses. So that's my own feeling. And I, again, um, I think down the line, it just perhaps not around this table, but it, it, it would, I think these organizations, we'd all benefit from an understanding of the metrics used to determine which nonprofits get what amount of money. And I think about the museum in general because they service so many people in town and yet they get a tiny portion of the budget. And so it's more just a general comment there and a question about the way that's listed. So just something to think about. Um, again. I, I think I would just offer um, to you that a lot of these were set sort of when we came in. You know, these were the certain amounts that and I don't know how they were determined over the years. Uh, some of them I understand a little bit more than others. Um, you know, like, for example, my first year here, I met with every single nonprofit. We went through all their you know, requests, what they typically got, what it was for. Um, the only one that we dramatically changed was Operation Hope, if you remember, uh, because they had come in and said you know, they weren't really getting anything. Um, and it seemed strange. So we had modified that because of the service that they do for, for Fairfield only uh, people. So we added that. That was a huge bump. They were always getting zero. And I think there was some assumption made because they were leasing the space over by the police station um, for a dollar a year or whatever it was mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that was a gift to them. And so we changed that. But like the other ones, they've kind of always been like that. Um, you know, I tried to give the History Center funding in the ARPA, the 400K for the permanent stage that Michael really wanted, and which I thought he should have, because he puts up a temporary stage. It didn't make any sense to me why we couldn't do it, but that got shot down by the other town bodies. Um, so um, I, I have been in discussion with him, and I would like to move forward with um, an ARPA request to give him some additional funding to assist with some of the uh, they're redoing the inside, like the exhibition area. And so I want to, um, it's not a huge amount, yeah. but I know he needs to raise some, and I felt bad that he, he didn't get his, you know, stage, because that really is was a home run. People love sitting out there. When I, especially when I'm leaving on Fridays, you know, I see everyone out there with their chairs, and they're having, like, listening to music. It's nice. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I kind of like this is what they get. Um, Grasmere has, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, Sullivan McKinney kind of fluctuates every year to Tom's point earlier because they they get a little, they get a certain amount, but then if they're having a project, they're like, oh, we need, you know, each year they say I need 10000 for this or we need 15000 for that because we're fixing something or something that's broken um, that, and that's a town building. Um, and so we give them, depending on what they ask for in that regard and like in Audubon this year you know they get a specific amount and then they came and said they doing this big rehab and could we give some so I think that's kind of how this has gone I don't know if it's pitting really I don't know if it, that's the right w word to use but we try to be as helpful when a when a nonprofit says like the Audubon did this year we need help extra help and we try to make that accommodation. So next year, maybe it's, you know, one year it was Pequot. Remember, what they were doing the roof, and that was a big nut, and we felt like that's a really a, a huge asset for our town 
because it's a third library mm -hmm. um, that we don't have to necessarily pay for. And that was very unconventional. And I got a lot of pushback for that. But I felt like it made sense for us to make an investment into the, a building. A, it's a historic building. It's beautiful. Um, and, and B, people really use it. Um, so, you know, I think we kind of been kind of working on that assumption. So maybe next year it's, you know, yeah. RISAP. Yeah. I mean, we gave LifeBridge, you know, ARPA money mm -hmm. uh, to help with the mental health uh, and stuff. So, you know, I don't know. I think it's a kind of it ebbs and flows. Um, on page 119, just quick, the IT storage, it's 75000 Is that just like lump sum for data storage, or are there other things that go into it? The town mass storage for 75K? Or did I they? Did have, he come before? He didn't come before us for this. Yeah, I I, I could have. Um, that. It's on page one nineteen. It's just. Yeah, I know, but what what is it? Mass storage. I I, I could have him send him an email. But my understanding is this is this was in the budget last year, and it's kind of, a th it's part of a, a multi-year program to like replace our servers. Um, so this is this is just just a portion of it, but it's just it's, just server storage basically. Um, and just something worth mentioning out loud for the record, um, the Board of Finance on page 123, just it's a $104,000 expense, but it's the audit fee, and I know that's like a one, there was one bidder, but that was like the biggest jump, and it stuck out, and I know that's from the audit, so. 122. Yes. On 123, right? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Yep. Um, we're very close. Thank you for, um, I wanted to mention and, and I will reach out to Julie directly. Um, but again, out loud, she updated um, on page 177. She kind of, in her overview, made a mention of the metrics on what the new per position was uh, enabled her to do. And I think that's really, really helpful. Um, okay. And really just kind of a comment and a suggestion for moving forward. When we do add positions, it's a great thing to see because I think it allows residents to understand the impact of changing these departments and, and why I've spent time saying, is it enough staff? Again, is the org chart the way it works? And um, so I just wanted to call her out for that. Um, the senior center has a huge increase in attendees. And so I wanted to ask the question of, of her, is it enough staff? Because it's, it's literally, I mean, it's astronomical, the amount of people that used to go there. and. Now that do go so, and the same thing is the only thing that went up in her budget is the office supplies, and I just want her to feel comfortable given the huge jump um, that she feels um, that she has enough to manage. So it'd be great to get that answer on the record. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask of Parks and Rec um, again organizationally, Frank. It was hard for me to look at just because as it was laid out, but. It could just be me. So my own observation about the org chart coming first, it might be helpful for people to see how much is under the purview of Parks and Rec. And so when you have that um, explanation document first, it's just kind of helpful to see what you're looking at. But that's preference. Um, and I wanted to know when the contract expired, the 720000 mowing contract that we talked about. I'm not arguing that this year is not the year to, to think about bringing it in-house for this year, for the fiscal year budget, but I'd be curious when the contract ends so that whoever is thinking about this next time can factor that in. So that'd be good to know. Okay. Um, and then finally, I wanted to circle back on Tom's question about the WPCA and reiterate um, that I had a conversation with the chair and the vice chair. They're not comfortable. Well, the, the chair had said he wasn't comfortable voting on a budget, obviously, if we're doing it before Monday, it's just not timing-wise possible. But um, there is some discrepancy over who is paying for the audit. So if the WPCA is paying for it, the chair and the vice chair felt we had to bring it back to the WPCA yes. for a vote. Yeah, Joe wrote, uh, what I said at the meeting was I talked to the chair about it, and he agreed it should be paid. He now, said that it should be paid for by the town, was his understanding. 
Oh, uh, maybe I miss. I, th yeah. I I said to him we should. We are looking into an RF, uh, to finding a consulting firm to do the audit, and I said I thought that the WPCA should pay it out of their fund balance. I want to correct. Should he didn't say should. He he understood that the town would be paying for it, not that the, that the town should. Oh, because he he my my understanding of that conversation was he I specifically said to him, and I know that I said that. I think the WPCA should pay for it. We should and just, he said to me he agreed. Okay. So, so maybe I misunderstood. Maybe he misunderstood what I asked. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just um, worth clarifying. But I know that Joe wrote a uh, yeah. email saying that the the WPCA was going to bring up the budget and this audit discussion before a meeting. I don't know which meeting when their meeting is. Do you know when? It's next? it's middle of the month. It's uh -huh. like the so it certainly wouldn't be in time as as Tom requested. Um, and there may be some, I don't know, I'm not speaking for either of them around yep. this table, but uh, it is worth clarifying, one, if the board feels like they need to vote for it for the next round with the Board of Finance, the audit, who's paying for it, because I think there is some misunderstanding. Um, and then also, when John Bodie submitted the original request, there were two additional jobs, and I know we're going through this audit, but he did... It was submitted, and Joe, apparent, Vice Chair Joe Devanzo, uh, had signed off or had agreed to a budget that had two additional jobs on it. And so, I guess, just what happened to those in your reimagining? So, do you? Because uh, so, I was on that email, and there was some question about maybe doing a meeting on Monday of the WPCA. Have you gotten any additional mm -hmm. info? I mean, I've been, okay. I haven't looked, but. Okay. Just curious. I mean, our meeting is Monday morning, so even still, I doubt they'd be. Now that it's Friday at four, I don't. They don't have enough time to. Yeah. I mean, it could be an emergency, I guess, like by Robert's rules. They could. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they could even call a WebEx. I don't know. Um, but to your uh, question regarding the staffing, um, when that that budget was presented to me. Um, during our, you know, department head, uh, each department comes in. I did not feel the justification was there, um, and that there, to be perfectly honest, um, the explanation was very, um, it wasn't substantive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, this doesn't, it's not adding up. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't, wasn't told how the, it would impact overtime, if at all. Um, so there were a lot of unanswered questions. Typically when a department head asks for even one FTE, there is a lot, to your point earlier, how, you know, people, um, Julie gave a good, you know, here's what I, what I need and here's what I'm going to produce and all this other stuff. Um, I didn't get that. So I felt it wasn't, um, something I was willing, I didn't have enough information to move forward with it. And I did, I, I need to know. Uh, that it's going to, what it's going to do, how it's going to work, why, you know, all of those reasons, any FTE. So I felt like after, and then uh, later on, because, you know, when we get the presentations from department heads, we sit, we talk, you know, and then we go back, my team, and we go over, and we go over, and we go over. It's, it's mind-numbing, actually. Um, but that's when we decided to talk about the audit. Uh, we wanted to have an internal audit. And I felt, you know, that makes sense. And why don't we wait for that and let, let that happen? And if, hey, if that audit says, you know, you need to add, maybe they need to add some other people and some other positions that we, we didn't know uh, because they reviewed other WPCAs and they're, you know, that's what they do and they know about it more than any of us. Um, I wanted to hold off. And then we can always make a transfer if we need that based on the audit findings. All right, so just in terms of finding, following up on um, the audit and the voting, will you, Jared, have a conversation with Mark Ellison or, and Joe, or, and or Joe, or how do you want to proceed well, on I, that? I could, but I thought. I'm happy to do know, it. I just yeah. want to clarify. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's a, yeah. you're, you're, you're the I'm happy to do it. I just want to liaison. Just ask them if they were thinking if they wanted to post a special <laughs> meeting maybe and do a WebEx. Um, Listen, I, I know it's tough. I don't know that, you know, Mr. Flynn, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of him, but how he's, he's going to not vote on something um, because of that. 
but I think he just has concerns about it. I think we all do. We all, I mean, right? We've We're all, all concerned. We, we want, you know, we want to know more. We want to see what's going on. That's all. Um, so, and I would push back, even though he's not here, that we still have to flush toilets. So, Amen. anyway, I don't have any more questions right now. All right. Well, that's good, actually. Efficient. Helpful. And you did a lot of homework. I did. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all. All right. Um, if there's no additional um, items uh, to bring up, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> I'll second. All in favor. Amen. I fly the amen. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. That was actually one of those. I know. Uh,